Good morning. Uh, I'd like to call the Planning Commission meeting to order. Uh, would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Danielle, would you take the roll? Commissioner Nora Dukas. Here. Commissioner Stephen Onstadt. Here. Chair Leo Molitor. Here. Commissioner Michael Wessner. Present. Uh, uh, item four on the agenda is a time set aside for comments by citizens on matters not appearing on the agenda. Does anyone wish to speak on an item not on the agenda? Thank you. Uh, then we'll go on to the next item, which is a continued item from the September 30th agenda. It is it's AP 10-0004, Mosler Rock Products, Ojai Quarry Appellant, Appeal of a Notice of Violation of cases PV08-0030, PV09-009, PV10-0012, PV10-0070, PV10-0072-79, and PV10-0080, and PV10-090. Before we have the presentation of the staff, uh, County Council, would you like to make a comment on 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 your role here? Um, well, in this particular proceeding, it's an appeal of several notices of violation, so I'm going to be representing the Planning Commission, and Robert Kwong will be representing the Planning staff. Thank you very much. Before we start the staff report, I will limit the county's presentation, the staff, to 20 minutes. I will limit the appellant's presentation to 20 minutes. And I will limit all speakers to five minutes. So, Ms. McGee. Thank you, Chairman, Commissioners. I'm Ebony J. McGee, and I'll be representing planning staff on this item. This is appeal for the violations for the Mazarak Ojai Quarry Conditional Use Permit, CUP 3489. Sorry about that. The project is located at 155 State Route 33 near the city of Ojai. Here's an aerial photo of the site. The project site has been a rock quarry since 1939. However, the first CUP was issued in January of 1976. The permit authorized the continuation of mining of the four acre project site for 20 years. In 1981, the PC granted a five year extension to that permit. And in 1995, the PC granted an additional nine-acre expansion and a 20-acre um, extension. So the new permit expiration date is 2015, and the project site is totally is 13 acres total. In February 2005, Mazda Rock purchased the site from the original owner, and in doing so, Mr. Mosler signed a reimbursement agreement which authorized the county to conduct post-approval condition compliance review and or site inspection and or permit research and review at Mr. Mosler's expense. In addition, Mr. Mosler signed an acceptance of conditions, which stated that he agreed to the um, conditions of approval and agreed to abide by them. Sorry. Currently, Mr. Mosler um, is not abiding by either of those conditions 
and currently has a balance of $77,184.09 for the condition compliance account and $8,186.74 for this appeal. There has been several violations issued by a number of departments and agencies at the site, four of which have been from the U.S. Department of Mine Safety and Health Administration, two in 2006 and two in 2004, all four hazardous conditions on the site. The Planning Division has issued four emergency use authorizations to allow the operator to conduct activities outside the permitted conditions in response to emergency situations. The most recent EUA issued was in 2006, which permitted the operator to remediate hazardous safety conditions on the southern portion of, this, of the mining site and remove hazardous boulders to abate an MSHA violation. Um, MSHA did not cite the owner for this violation, but did note that there was a violation during the inspection. The operator then obtained the permit to um, abate that violation. Since 2008, 14 other violations have been issued for the Maserac Ojai Quarry from the Planning Division. Those violations include mining outside of the permitted boundaries, exceeding maximum daily truck trips, trucking through restricted zones during restricted times, failure to maintain and submit trucking contracts, operating outside of permitted hours of operation, and operating unpermitted equipment on site. The Planning Division has issued two violations for mining outside of the boundaries. The PV080030 is actually not being appealed. That was issued in 2008, but we issued another violation in 2010, PV100090, for the same thing. The appellant argues that staff have misinterpreted the conditions of approval and what the phased mining plan is intended. And while there are areas of disturbance beyond the approved mine phasing plan, such disturbance is not a product of mining. Staff disagrees with that interpretation and cites SMARA, which says surface mining operations means all or any part of the process involved in mining of materials on mine lands. As you can see in this photo here, there are several areas of disturbance outside of the phased plan as well as outside of the entire mining boundary. Um, this here is actually a rock failure. Um, however, Mr. Mosler, the owner of the quarry, has done some work in that area as well, which constitutes mining on a mining site. There's also a haul road in there that was not originally in the, in the plan. And um, as you can see, there are several areas outside of what was permitted. The Planning Division issued a violation for operation for operating um, in excess of the number of permitted truck trips. Condition 39 states that the site shall have no more than 20 truck trips. The appellant argues that the condition specifies product trips and therefore only trucks carrying the primary product of the site should be counted in the 20 max. However, Staff argues that the product, that product was used in a generic sense, referring to all materials leaving the site. In fact, the EIR only evaluated the request at the time, which was a maximum production rate of 50,000 tons and 20 truck trips. The EIR analyzed those 20 truck trips in, in regards to traffic, and therefore any increase to the truck trips would require further environmental analysis. The Planning Division issued a violation for trucks passing through the restricted zone, specifically in front of Nordoff High School, during the restricted times. Condition 40 limits truck trips from driving through the city of Ojai between 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. The appellant argues that the county is without authority to enforce trucking limitations because such matters are regulated under the California Vehicle Code. However, the trucking limitations referenced in the condition are directly related to the surface mining land use and traffic impacts, which are a direct result of such land use. And these limitations are an extension of the county's non-coastal zoning ordinance. Furthermore, there's a court case cited in your memo that you received that addresses this issue. 
and the court ruled that the county is within it, acting within its regulatory authority by restricting truck travel. Um, this is a map of the city of Ojai limits. And as you can see there, right here is the beginning of the city of Ojai, and that's Nordoff High School, so that's used as a marker. And in evalu evaluating complaints received, staff looked at the times that the trucks left the Ojai Quarry. As you can see on this side, there's about four miles between Ojai Quarry and Nordoff High School. So all complaints that received that saw um, trucks leave the site or within this restricted zone, roughly within the 8 o'clock hour, was, were assumed to have been within the city of Ojai limits. To investigate alleged violations regarding trucking, the operator is required to keep contracts with all trucking companies used. The contract is the planning division's vehicle to ensure that all truckers are aware of the trucking limitation conditions on the project site. When requested, the operator was unable to provide such contracts. Therefore, the planning division issued violations for all instances in which the contracts were requested and not provided. The applicant argues that the op I'm sorry, the appellant argues that the operator has entered into verbal contracts with the, with the drivers. However, unfortunately, there's no way for staff to verify such contracts have been obtained. Therefore, written contracts will be required to demonstrate compliance with this condition. Staff has advised the appellant that, they, that he may submit a draft contract for review and approval, which that contract could serve as a sample for all others, but no samples have been received to date. On March 30th, 2010, planning staff observed several trucks entering the Mossler Rock Ojai Quarry before the permitted hours, operating hours of 7 a.m. Thus, planning division issued a violation. The appellant argues that the condition does not explicitly prevent trucks from entering the site. However, the condition does limit mining activities and shipping, shipping during these hours. Driving trucks onto the site for loading is an accessory to mining activities and shipping, and therefore any trucks on site to engage in mining activities or shipping is subject to the hours of operation at 7 a.m. Furthermore, the appellant will argue that the trucks observed on site were Mr. Mosler's personal vehicles. Um, there was one truck, and if you turn to page 310 through 312 of your staff report package, the original one, you'll see pictures of all the trucks. There were three trucks cited. One of them was a personal vehicle. The other two were commercial vehicles. We issued one violation for all three. And finally, the planning division issued a violation for unpermitted equipment on site. The appellant has no argument that the equipment on site is not part of the original permitted equipment. However, the appellant argues that such equipment is an accessory to the mining operation. This is a list of the permitted equipment from the original permit, and this is what was submitted to planning staff in 2007 by the operator showing what was on site. The appellant is requesting the planning commission to uphold appeal case number AP 10004 and direct planning staff to interpret and apply CUP 3489-2 conditions 1B 1930 and 40 to the Miles of Rock Ojai Quarry as presented in the appellant's appeal as amended and overturn the zoning violation case case numbers. Actually, that would not PV 080030 because that one is not being appealed, but it has the same um, basis as PV 09009. And PV 10.0.0.12, PV 10.0.0.70, PV 10.0.0.72 through 79, PV 10.0.0.80, and PV 10.0.0.90. The planning staff recommends that the planning commission take the following actions. Certify that the commission has reviewed and considered the staff report and all exhibits thereto, and has considered all comments received at the public hearing on this matter. Deny appeal case AP 10.0.0.0.4. Thus, upholding staff's interpretation and application of CUP 3489-2, conditions number 1B, 1939 and 40, as discussed in section B of the staff report, and uphold the notices of violation for zoning case numbers PV 090009, PV 10012, PV 
10-0070, PV 10-0072-79, and PV 10-0080, PV 10-0090. Thank you, and that concludes staff's presentation. Thank you, Ebony, and thank you for staying within your time. You're well within your 20 minutes. Before you leave and before we have any questions, I'd like to ask for disclosures by the commissioners. At this time, I would like to ask each planning commissioner to state on the record whether or not he or she has received any oral or written ex parte communication regarding this agenda item that is not already contained in the record before us on this matter. Please disclose the substance of that information only if that information is not contained in the record before us on this matter. Commissioner Dukas? I have no disclosures. Commissioner Lassa? No disclosures. Commissioner Wester? I have no disclosures. <clears throat> I did drive by the site yesterday. I was in Ohio and I drove by and, and uh, looked and then came back. Uh, questions of the staff? Any questions? Uh, just, just a matter of uh, bookkeeping. Since you did submit Exhibit uh, 12, we're on the con staff recommendation for number two uh, regarding the denial of the appeal additional language. Are you requesting us to accept that additional language? Yes, I'm accepting that you accept that additional language. And the recommended actions. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Wessner. Commissioner, I thought you may have some questions later. Yes, sir. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Thank you very much, Ebony. Okay, I would like to open open the uh, public hearing at this time, and we will hear now from the appellant or the appellant's representative. One moment. I, I think we need to queue up my presentation, commissioners. As that's happening, perhaps, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may make uh, two requests. Number one, I, I do believe that 20 minutes is doable for my presentation. That was what I aimed for when I prepared my presentation. I know we have a few other speakers. Um, I'd ask that particularly Mr. Mossler be attributed the five minutes speaking time and that the 20 minutes come to me. That way, that the, five, the 20 minutes doesn't count towards him if that would be acceptable to the commission. That's acceptable. And then also, if I may have a few brief moments at the end after any other members of the public uh, have spoken to have a brief rebuttal, I would appreciate that. That's part of the process. Okay, I appreciate that. Let me, uh, well, I'm, I, hopefully I can operate the PowerPoint presentation, but uh, members of the commission, good morning. My name is Derek Cole. I am an attorney. I represent Larry Mossler. Mr. Mossler is seated in the brown jacket. Uh, Larry's wife, Grace Mossler is with him and she is seated in the uh, tan uh, jacket and they are the owners of the Ojai Quarry. As you can see they are uh, not out of state, not big corporations, they're two local residents who own this quarry and this quarry is their livelihood and I have some very significant issues with the notices of violations and, and how th those matters have progressed but let me briefly give you a road map for my presentation so you can make sure that I progress along and I don't get stuck anywhere. First I want to talk and make a few comments about why we are here today and I want to put the violations in their proper context. Then I will address the merits of each of the violations and I will do so by addressing the boundary issue, the equipment issue, and then I'll get into the trucking issue and then I'll have a few comments at the end to conclude. But commissioners, why we're here today, this quarry is the smallest mine in the county. Uh, it is the smallest by a significant degree. There are some quarries in this county that have amply more, uh, considerably more production. Uh, the Mosslers purchased this quarry in 2005, so they've owned it for about five years. And since about the past two or three years, or the last two or three years, there seems to have been a fixation on this quarry and there has been a considerable amount of attention that has been paid to just this quarry. Uh, let me start by showing you the first slide. This is 
we, we obtained records from the billings that the county has been sending out to all the mines. I apologize, I did include this in a letter, uh, it's, so it's kind of hard to see. But what this basically shows is that when you look at production, permitted production levels, you have mines that are 10, 20, and 30 times the production capacity of this quarry, yet have only received about a fraction of the enforcement time by staff. And what this shows is that there is a disproportionate focus on this quarry compared to operations that are vastly larger in production. And now, I want to be clear that that doesn't in and of itself mean that there's something wrong with the violations. We all understand the speeding uh, motorist idea that, well, the other guy was going faster than I was. Well, if you're violating the law, you're violating the law. So that's not our position. But the point is, as, as, a, as a context, you have a staff that has been focusing a considerable amount of ten attention on the smallest mine in this county. And there has been a very, in my opinion, a very deliberate effort to make an issue of this quarry. And I'll go through each of the violations. But there are a few things that I think I need to point out at the beginning. Number one is the time frame of the violations. All of them came within a very short period of time between late April and July of this year. And there were a lot of events that went on before that. And if I had more than 20 minutes, I could, I could share those with you. But the fact is you have a, a lot of violations all coming within a short period of time. And then also the number of violations. You heard staff indicate that there were 14 violations. The, there, there was a deliberate effort to find as many things that staff could find with this quarry, as I'll show. Some of these so-called violations, if, if they had been prosecuted when they could have been prosecuted, could have been raised years ago but they were all focused in this one short time frame and that suggests that there's a very concerted effort towards this quarry. Now what's going on is also part, only part of the picture. Staff did present that there was an issue concerning a reclamation plan and originally that was the main focus of this hearing was that it was about alleged SMARA violations but we had to take a, an appeal to the State Mines and Geology Board because what had happened is you had a reclamation plan that Mr. Mossler submitted at the request of staff, the former staff, uh, both of whom are here. Mr. Mossler submitted a reclamation plan uh, in light of some of the violations that arose with the boundary issues and he followed everything that staff asked him to do. That reclamation plan has languished now for more than two and a half years. And as a result, the State Mines and Geology Board has accepted the appeal. And they accepted the appeal on the ground that staff did not timely, process, did not timely uh, re review and, and forward the reclamation plan for state review. So you have a situation where Mr. Mossler did everything he was required to do. He tried to work with staff, and then staff did a complete 180-degree reversal and determined that his reclamation plan was not okay. And he had to go to the State Mines and Geology Board. And, and, and that matter is now on appeal. So I'm probably throwing a lot of facts at you all out at once. I've, I've tried to address these in the written submissions that I've provided. But you, you heard from staff that Mr. Moss, you get the impression that he's somehow some violator, that he, he violates his conditions uh, as if it's just something he, he, he enjoys doing, and that is not at all the case. Mr. Mossler has been trying to deal with these issues for three years, and staff has been an extraordinary impediment to him doing that. And, and so I have to try to put some of this in context. We've been working on this for a considerable amount of time. Now, let me move into the merits, and let me start with the boundary issue. Uh, staff has determined, quote unquote, that Mr. Mossler is mining, and I, I use air quotes because they use that as a term of art, and they rely on the SMARA uh, definition of mining, which that, the reason why SMARA defines surface mining so broadly is to make sure that every aspect of a surface mine is reclaimed. They are not defining mining, in and in, so that's, that's a policy-based, uh, that's a policy-based 
definition. It has no application to whether or not Mr. Mossler in this situation or any other operator is mining. Now, Mr. Mossler has a phased mining plan, so he's supposed to progress from phase one to a phase two to a phase three. And what you have is you have areas outside of the phase one where he currently is where he has disturbed areas. Now, there's a very key distinction in the mining industry between what's actually mining, which is extraction for saleable products, versus areas that are disturbed. In any mining operation, whether in this county or throughout the state, you will have areas that are disturbed for plants, for haul roads, for other things that are not actually, you don't actually go in and excavate the, the land. So when you, when you look at an aerial photograph, you might see areas of disturbance, but that doesn't mean there's mining going on. And let, me, let me move to the next exhibit. Let me show you now what... So what I, what I have here is, on the left, is a 2008 aerial photograph. And this is an aerial photograph I received from staff. On the right is a 2004 aerial photograph. And so if I can use what, what staff pointed to in its presentation is it was looking at areas that are outside of the permit, the, the phasing boundaries, which you see in, in colors, and then you see the ultimate boundary in a, in a, bold, da a bold black line. But you see staff pointed to areas outside of that boundary. It pointed to two in particular. And you see that on the right, if you look at the 2004 aerial photograph, and again, this was before Mr. Mossler acquired this mine. This was under the prior owner. You see that that same area of disturbance already existed. The same is true with the area beneath the mining permit boundaries. You see, again, in the 2004 aerial photograph, that area of disturbance already existed. And in fact, while there... there Basically, the areas of disturbance have not changed. Uh, they may have changed a little bit, but in a significant sense, they have not since Mr. Mossler and his wife acquired the mine in 2005. So these areas of disturbance that staff has referenced were there well before Mr. Mossler took over that mine. Now, Mr. Mossler was required. Staff addressed MSHA violations. The, the quarry is naturally a very steep area. So there are naturally some large boulders that are upslope of the processing areas. And so MSHA cited Mr. Mossler and demanded that he remove what are called perched boulders, which are large boulders which in certain events could literally come down the hill and injure life or, or property. And so Mr. Mossler was required to remove these mount, was required to remove these boulders. Uh, and that's something that I reference condition 3A3 of Mr. Mossler's permit. The permit recognizes that there may be removal of these boulders separate and apart from what's actually in the mining phased areas. Condition 3A3 requires Mr. Mossler, and I won't repeat the quote verbatim, but it requires him to identify and remove perch boulders prior to quarry operations. So that's a removal activity that Mr. Mossler is required by his permit to do, and it is something that MSHA wanted him to do. But it is not mining. It is not mining in the sense that he's digging up property on a long-term basis for saleable product. The condition recognizes that. And I'll also, most importantly, Note that staff has already addressed this issue, and I think that is the thing that is the most troubling, is that we received a notice of violation, I think back in May, for mining outside of our boundaries, yet prior staff who are here, they, th th this issue w was considered. Staff, uh, Mr. Richards uh, was involved, I believe Ms. Aragon was involved in that, they required Mr. Mossler to go out and submit engineering studies, which he did. He prepared reports. They had the county's geologist, who I understand is also here, review this information. And they determined that, that Mr. Mossler was mining in phase one and that these other areas of disturbance were not mining. And let me show you a letter that Mr. Richards wrote on February 14, 2008. 
It says, in comparing the quarry operations plan and a 2007 aerial topographic map provided by Jensen Design and Engineering, that's Mr. Mossler's engineering firm, planning has determined you are mining within phase one of the quarry operations plan and are not currently mining outside the approved mining boundary. Now again, reference back to the 2004 aerial photograph that I showed you. All of those areas of disturbance were in existence as of at least 2004. And these are the same areas of disturbance that staff are now pointing to today. Yet Mr. Richards in this letter indicated that mining was not going on in those areas. Now the letter continues, uh, Donald M. Jensen of Jensen Design and Survey, again Mr. Mossler's uh, engineering firm, in a July 2007 letter state, we have compared the contours of this survey with quarry operations plan and cross sections prepared as exhibits to the June 8, 1995 CUP approval, and it is our conclusion that the operation is within the phase 1B removal area. So. Commissioners, the important thing here is that there was an engineering determination which was based on an engineering evaluation and review of aerial photographs by those who are trained to make these determinations that mining was occurring in phase one and not elsewhere. Now, I, I, I mean no disrespect at all to those who are planners because they perform vital functions, but planners don't have the ability or the expertise to make every possible determination. They have to go out and get the experts. And in this situation, that is what your staff previously did, and that is the conclusion they reached. Now the upshot of that is what staff required is for Mr. Mossler to submit a reclamation plan to address these disturbed areas. That was why Mr. Mossler submitted an amended reclamation plan. So staff said, Mr. Mossler, submit that plan and we will process it. That is how we will handle this issue of having disturbed areas. Staff did not say at that time that you need to amend your permit boundaries and turn those and, and make those part of your phasing. And that's important because Mr. Mossler followed what staff directed him to do. And that was reflected in the notice of violation that was issued in 2008. Mr. Mossler did that. Staff processed the reclamation plan staff certified that that reclamation plan met all SMARA requirements. That is a certification that is required by SMARA. It says that the planning uh, staff cannot forward a reclamation plan to the state unless they certify that it is compliant. And your staff did that. So Mr. Mossler addressed the boundary issue. He did what staff wanted him to do and he complied with SMARA. Now, sometime either late last year or early this year, your new staff took a 180 degree turn from what your prior staff did and have come up with an entirely new idea of let's make Mr. Mossler amend his permit boundaries. And, and they did that quite frankly without ever providing us any explanation or without ever really even acknowledging what staff had done before. And so to this day, I don't really understand why staff has done that. And it makes no sense because Mr. Mossler, in his reclamation plan, these disturbed areas, or most of them that staff pointed out to you, is going to reclaim those. He's going to not mine those. And his reclamation plan would require that he, 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 he reclaim it as part of a phased mining plan, meaning he will reclaim that area while he's mining elsewhere. So does it make sense, commissioners, to require Mr. Mossler to amend his permit boundaries to incorporate these areas, which he's not going to mine, into his quote unquote mining areas? No, it does not. And that's why what staff had previously done makes sense. And that's why we are objecting to this notice of violation. Apart from the fact that we did what staff required us to do, it absolutely makes no sense to amend those permit boundaries to uh, incorporate areas that are never going to be mined into a phasing area. That just makes no sense from any practical standpoint. 
So, commissioners, we would ask, to find, ask you to find that, in fact, Mr. Mossler is not mining outside of his permitted areas. And I, I think I've beaten that issue to death. Let me move now to the equipment issue. And this is something I also find very troubling. Staff laid out Mr. Mossler's equipment list in the 1995 permit. It is now 2010, and so naturally there's been some evolution in the equipment that is being used at that quarry. So Mr. Mossler is using equipment that was not indicated in that 1995 permit. Now, the staff did not mention this in oral presentation, and it's only briefly mentioned in its written report, but Mr. Mossler has submitted equipment lists to the planning division. It did so twice in 2006. It did so once in 2007. I'm putting it up here. I'm not expecting any of you to actually strain your eyes and read this, but this is the equipment list that Mr. Mossler provided in January of 2007. So this list has been sitting with staff for three years. Staff is aware of this. Clearly they reference it in their report. And yet they cite Mr. Mossler for having unpermitted equipment without any explanation as to why this list, quite frankly, is not acceptable. Now, let's say staff says, you know what, Mr. Mossler, we understand you have a list, but we want you to do it a different way. That's fine. If there's another way to do it, we'll do it that way. But why does this matter need to be addressed as a notice of violation? I note the condition. It said this is the condition that deals with the uh, equipment list. If you read at the end, it limits the equipment that can be used. But it says unless changes to this list are approved in writing by the planning director. Now, to me, it would have been very simple for staff to present to the planning director the list and ask that she sign something indicating that's okay or advise Mr. Mossler why it's not okay. Why does this need to progress as a notice of violation is my question. When there was an effort by Mr. Mossler to comply with that condition and, and, and that list had been exi in existence for three years. Now, if, that, if, if doing it that way wasn't good enough, then okay, tell us that. But why why Excuse me, Mr. Cole, yes. let me take a few minutes. Uh, okay. Your time is up. And, uh, Mr. Chair, if I may, <clears throat> yeah. I understand we'd like to control speakerships, but uh, the appellant did extend us the courtesy on the 30th of September, not going to the late hours of the night. So I agree. Wrap it up. I but if you need a couple extra minutes, I think we should extend at least a couple minutes courtesy on that. Okay. Okay. I'm, I, I think I've handled the equipment issue. Let me address the truck issue, and then, quite frankly, I'm done at that point and others can speak. On the trucking violations, I'll note the issue of vehicle code preemption. I've raised that issue. I think that's a predominantly legal issue. I don't need to beat that issue to death here. Um, I will note that vehicle code section 21 says that le local agencies cannot adopt or enforce ordinances that are not expressly authorized by, uh, by the vehicle code. The enforcement of a zoning ordinance is therefore falls under that language. I understand that there is a trial court ruling here by Judge Reiser that suggests the opposite. That's an issue that I hope we don't have to raise because I hope we can resolve the issue today. But I acknowledge that that's a, a point we will have to raise uh, if, if unfortunately things uh, don't go as we hope they do. As to the hours of operation, let me quickly point out um, what you have here. There were three trucks that staff observed on March 30th. One of those is Mr. Mossler's personal vehicle, that vehicle right there. So staff has essentially cited Mr. Mossler for, for driving his vehicle onto the quarry property. I realize that's not their intent, and I realize today if they understand that, they, they would acknowledge that that's not what they intended to do but they did cite, cite him for having a, a, a pickup drive on, on the property. Um, also, a, a concern of my client, if you look at the last photograph, and you look at, you see that little shed there by the truck, this is the photograph looking forward, so that little knoll there, that little hill is where staff had to be when they took the picture. 
Now, Mr. Mossler is concerned that staff was trespassing on his property at the time they took this picture. Now, staff has indicated they weren't, and I, I take them at face value that they believe they did not, but in fact, when you look at the property lines, that's where they were. And if you look at, this is a map of the property lines that Mr. Mossler owns, that blue arrow is where they would have had to be on the other side of a hill. So you had staff that were going out on the Mr. Mossler's property to cite him for three trucks, one of which was his, the other two that were going in at 10, uh, 10 minutes before the quarry gate opens. Now on that point, the, the, first of all, I've, I've explained in our, in our papers that the, the condition does not say that trucks may not go in prior to loading hours. And in fact, if loading is permitted at 7 a.m., that implies that a truck can be queued up at 7 a.m. to be loaded, which would indicate that a few minutes before that time, the truck can move into position. It's kind of like if we all have to report to work at 8 a.m., as many of us do, we're expected to be at our desk and working at 8 a.m., which means we have to come in a little bit earlier, get set up, that sort of thing. It's the same principle. Also, it's just a, it's a very impractical conclusion by staff because these trucks, if they can't come in the quarry property a few minutes early, what they do, in my experience throughout the state, what I've seen with other mining operations is they'll go find somewhere on along a public road or by a coffee shop or wherever to sit and idle. And so the, the practical impact of staff's interpretation is that you're forcing these trucks to go idle somewhere to wait until precisely 7 o'clock so that they can time going into the quarry. Well, I assume staff would demand uh, the same, if it's going to take this position as to Mossler, I would assume it will take the same position after every mine in this county. And if that's the considerate, if that's the interpretation staff takes, then you're going to have a situation where you have operators or these truck operators who are going to go find places to stay until they can go in and idle on public roads. And I, I just don't see what the benefit of that is. Uh, but along, as far as other operation, as far as other trucking um, concerns, we have provided, let's, as far as the overburden issue, I'll, I'll close with that. The, the quarry use permit very clearly says product trips. It does not say trips. And when you look at every other mining operator CUP in this county, with the exception of one, that term is not used. So the term that is used in all your other operators is just project trips is one term, or just trips. So from that, we infer that there is a difference between a, a product trip, which is the actual rock that is produced at the quarry, and something else. Waste and overburden is not considered a product. It is a waste material. It is uneconomic. It, it's, you, you can either sell it at a marginal value, or you can, usually you can't even break even selling it. So that, that's what the permit says. And I understand staff takes different positions, but the permit says what the permit says. And, and I think that's the important thing. So if I may make a, a brief, some brief concluding remarks, and then I, I thank the commission for allowing me to go over my time. Um, this staff is very fixated on this quarry, and I think when you look at all of the facts, there is no basis for that. These violations uh, are not supportable. And so we'd ask the commission to find and deny, well, ask the commission not to uphold the uh, staff determinations. I note that we did try to, between the time of our last hearing and, and the time of today's hearing, to submit permit adjustment and to try to work this out voluntarily. Staff has indicated we can't do that. They've cited a county code section that says that essentially we have to waive our right to appeal in order to have those permit adjustments processed. And uh, commissioners, I. I I, it seems like a strange rule to have that's been on the books apparently. We can't do that because I, I just don't feel that any of these violations are supportable and quite frankly we shouldn't be here. The other, the final remark is as, as staff presented, not only is Mr. Mossler having to deal with all of this, but he's being now required, or the staff is indicating that he should be paying them $77,000 and then another $8,000 for this appeal. 
$85,000 to deal with all of these issues that frankly shouldn't, he shouldn't be dealing with in the first place and other issues that he thought he was dealing with, but yet staff completely reversed course. I was informed yesterday that staff is now planning to charge Mr. Mossler for defending against his state mines and geology board appeal. And, and that one really took the cake because you have a situation where an operator was forced to invoke a state mines and geology board remedy on the ground of the county's failure to timely process and comply with SMARA and that appeal was accepted and now the county in defending against that appeal is going to charge him for all of its time, all of its research, all of its document duplication and that just to me really seems um, uh, unfair and, and inappropriate and so commissioners I'll, I'll be happy to answer any questions I, I again thank you for allowing me to go over the time and I apologize I wonder if we should have questions now or after all of the yes uh, I think we'll have any other people who are speaking in favor of your appeal and if you haven't filled out a speaker card not you mr. Cole but would anyone else who's going to speak uh, fill out a speaker card if not you uh, we have some cards up here yeah they're they're out in front and then uh, but anyone else who wishes to speak in favor of the appeal may speak now with a with a five minute We'll take a, about a five-minute break while, while the cards are being filled out. Thank you. Is the planning director ready? Okay. All right. We'd like to resume the meeting then. And uh, I have two cards. The first one is Mr. Mosler. Would you please come forward and state your name and address? Larry Mosler, 2280 Moon Ridge Avenue, Newbury Park. Since I'm limited on time, I'm going to speak very fast. I have lots of stuff to cover and short time to do it. Um, <clears throat> my wife and I own 94 acres up there and we have 13 acres that's permitted this mine was in operation since 1939 and we bought it five years ago uh, the previous owner mined from the bottom up meaning he drilled into the side of the mountain at the base made a big shot dropped the face down so we have huge verticals up there shortly after uh the well, first thing i had to do when i took over the mine was notice by m shaw m shaw's federal mine safety health administration they are in charge of all mining in this country. They deal with safety only, safety issues. Uh, I had to let them know that I moved my operation from a mobile operation to a permanent location. They came out approximately two weeks afterwards and said, uh, started inspecting and said that this is the first time they ever heard of this place up there. They never knew that it existed. And the law says that uh, they have to inspect twice a year. So we went through our inspections and whatnot, and they uh, told me about the high wall hazards that we have of the rock faces, potential rock coming down from the high walls, whatnot. Uh, after they came back, uh, I think a couple months later, and then uh, I formulated a plan to I uh, mitigate the seriousness of the high walls and the safety issues. They issued me two citations mandating that I must remove all safety issues and make that quarry safe. One 
The first violation was down in a lower area, down by the scales, meaning every perch boulder, anything that was on the side of that mountain that had any opportunity at all to come down had to be taken down to make it safe for my employees and myself and anyone else that was there. The second one was up at the top end. It went from the right-hand side to the left-hand side. Then uh, on the right-hand side, top right-hand side, the areas that are in question that is called, we're referring to as the disturbed area. I have photographs going back to 1978 showing that natural erosion occurred up there. I have photographs 78, uh, 86, 92, 98 that show the natural erosion progressing on down. I have a condition in my CUP that states I must I provide a plan to planning staff that locates every perch boulder that is on the side of that mountain that could potentially pose a safety issue that comes down and injures anyone. I provided this plan to them. The whole side of the mountain is full of perch boulders. So the condition states that I must remove these perch boulders prior to activating any mining operations. In order to get to these perch boulders, you have to create roads and you have to do it in a phased program to where you can't just take a bulldozer, climb up the side of the mountain and start pushing on a 150 ton or 500 ton boulder, have it come down take and go across the pad and down into the creek and then up over the other side onto the road and kill somebody in a car. You can't do that. You have to do it in a very planned, precise, slow, methodical manner to control the fall of the rock so it do, you, you don't lose it. I have photographs of one big rock that is half the size of this room that I was trying to bring down and I lost it and it came down and stopped right on my final berm of my lower pad before it went down into the creek. I have a mandate from Army Corps Fish and Game, uh, NOAA, Army Corps, uh, who else? All of the bure bureaucrats on the North Fork Matillahawk Creek, which runs by me, with the steelhead, uh, endangered species of steelhead trout that I have been working with them for a year and a half to make everything the way they want it. We have finally, the, the biggest problem I had, and the newspaper did an article on it, was I have a catch-22 situation. I've got ten agencies that want ten different things. Nobody, none of these people will come together to take and say, okay, let's settle, we want this, this is how we want it, and whatever. We finally had a big meeting out there and we got NOAA to take and take the lead. They got all these people together. We formulated... Mr. Mosler, your time is up, but I want you to have some more time because you, you need to let us know what you want us to know. So take some more time. Okay, but I, I, that's why I'm speaking fast. Okay. <laughs> but try not to go too much longer. You know, and... and um Regarding speaking fast, I know that if you don't get a chance to say, I'll have questions, I have, and, we I, don't, and we're not limited on time on our questions. So um, just let's just, this is so important, and, um, <laughs> and I'm having this sympathetic, you know, getting frantic, thinking that we're, we're up against some time limit that we've imposed, and I, I, I think it's getting in the way of us being able to, to really consider what uh, Mr. Mosler has to say. So um, I really appreciate that, Commissioner uh, Molitor. Right. Let's just... Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> because I, 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 I hear felt you. this was my last or my only chance to speak, and I'm going to get in as much as I can. And we're here to listen to you. Okay. So th okay. Thank you for that flexibility. Thank you. All right, um, so back to the steelhead trout. I have all of the agencies now. I, I, I've hired all of my consultants, engineers, and everything. We have cleared up all of the issues that these agencies have had with 
the creek. There are no more issues. We had a slide in 08 that the hill came down, impacted 20% of the slide, impacted the creek. And then so we were blocking the creek. Before I could go in and remove the slide, I have to have three times this much paperwork and approval from everybody and their brother, but I'm getting real good press time that I'm up here, I'm the fish killer, I am killing the fish by blocking the stream, and I can't do a thing about it because I'm not allowed. So now you think you have a letter in your file from NOAA and Fishing Game telling you that we are down at the very end now. We're rebuilding the slope. We have our final revegetation plan drawn and it's for the final approval and we're going to get that, but I anticipate being finished with this in another 30 days and that's going to be the end of me killing the fish in the creek because I won't be able to do it. I've dug back the side of my mountain. I've dug a huge retention, retention basin that the, the engineers calculated out that it will, the capacity of the, it will hold a half a million gallons of water on my site and it will percolate back into the ground to where none of this water, when it rains, will go into the creek. So I'm real happy about that because now nobody's going to be up there taking pictures. I got muddy water running down into the creek killing the fish. So that is that issue is pretty much gone. But the big issue is I have perch boulders up there. I have a condition that says you must remove it. I submitted a plan to planning to remove it. They say no. I can't do it. I can't go up there. I can't. I have to mine that hill within that mining limit, meaning I cannot build a road to go up along the side on my own property. I can't build a road to go up onto the side to access from the top and work down. Anyone, the person who drew this mining plan initially, I don't know where they found this person but I have a rock quarry that goes up the side of a mountain. And the way this plan is drawn, you are to mine from the bottom and work up. That's physically impossible to do. Common sense would tell anyone you have to, if you're going to cut, whenever grading contractor goes out and is going to do a housing project and they're going to cut a hill down. They go to the top of the hill and start cutting from the top down and the bottom is the last thing that's cut. This plan says I start at the bottom and I work up. Now we're dealing with rock that can come down and kill you. And I say, I tell planning, I am not going, I'm going to adhere what the federal government tells me to do. M. Shaw says, you will do it safely. And I say, I am going to do it safely because I'm not going to be in the courthouse trying to defend myself over, well, Mr. Mossler, did you know this was unsafe condition that you had your people go and do? And I'm going to lie to him and say, no, I didn't know that was unsafe. Well, all these years of experience that you have and knowledge that you have, you didn't know that was unsafe? You know, I, right. You know, I'm going to be lying to him. I, I'm not going to do that. We're going to do this in a safe manner, and we're going to follow all the rules and regulations. But it, it's, it's like... You can't have it both ways. You can't have your cake there and eat it too the way planning wants it. Here, good example, which hasn't been brought up yet. <clears throat> when I first came into the quarry in 05, I had a portable crushing plant. It was too big to bring in the quarry, so I sold the plant, and then I met with county EPA people, air pollution people. 
they made a comment to me at that time because I told them I am going to be crushing in there at some point in time. They told me you will not have a generator in there running your crushing plant. I said, fine, I'll bring in power then, you know, because I don't have any power. All right. So we have just eight months ago, a year ago, probably eight months ago, we finally got to the point where I have enough room. I purchased a small crushing plant, spent a quarter million dollars buying this crushing plant, brought it in. It's permitted with the state. I notify the county. I notify APCD. My, the rules say whenever you bring in any screening crushing equipment, it has to be permitted by the state or permitted by county APCD. If it's permitted by the state, it doesn't have to be permitted by the county, but you have to notify the county. So this is what I do. And I have a folder full of every letters every time I notify the county and this and that. So I take and bring in my crusher, and then I don't have power the first time I just rented a generator and then I have my electrician take and draw an electrical plan so that I can take and submit to Edison and have Edison bring power in powers right across the street right across the street down 100 feet there's the pole I have my plan drawn I have Edison come out submit my plan to Edison Edison approves the plan, they come back and they say, okay, here's the contract, send us $4,800, whatever it is, and sign the contract. I send them a check, sign the contract, send it all in, send my electrician into the county to take and pull a permit so I can bring power in. The electrician goes up to the county, and the county says, Oh, uh, Mr. Electrician, Mr. Mossler has some violations against his quarry, so we won't let you bring power in now. So my electrician is dumbfounded. He comes back and he tells me this. I can't have power brought in. And so I have been, I says, well, you know, that's not quite right. We'll, we'll deal with that. We've been dealing with it for, I guess, four months or so. My crusher's been sitting idle for that period of time. Here, a week and a half ago, I went and spent $31,000 to buy a generator and moved the generator in and started to run my crusher with the generator. I'm going to use that generator until it wears out and it's going to pollute the air, which APCD doesn't want. I have my contract Edison has my money for power. I can't get it. Now, I get a phone call this morning. I want to put lights up there, and I want to put a security camera. One of my guys called me this morning and tell me, well, somebody again broke in up there, stole fuel out of my, fuel tr out of my water truck, and stole some wire that we had there. I said, Daryl, just call the cops, have them make another police report because I have a folder in my, in my desk, all the police reports from vandalism, theft, and everything else I have up there because I don't have lights and I don't have a camera. We put up a six-foot high fence all around, but they still go around the fence because the fence can't be put up across the creek because I'm impacting the fish. So, I have spent now $31,000 to run a generator that I did not need to do. But planning says I have the violations and I'm a bad boy and they're going to make me pay. Um, I am in Kathy, Supervisor Kathy Long's district. Now, the split on a district on my side of Highway 33 is Long's district. On the other side of Highway 33 is Steve Bennett's district. Now, with Bennett, he has, it's my perception, he has one objective, to shut that quarry down, however he can have it shut down. Because our perception is this stuff has to start someplace up here, and then it rolls downhill. I have 
had two meetings with Kathy Law about my court. I have sent her two or three other letters requesting meetings with her about this. She refuses to have meetings with her. One of the letters I pointed out to her the fact I'm a significant property owner in your district. I am a business person employing people in your district creating jobs. I'm this, I'm that, I'm the other. I pay taxes. I do all of this stuff. It's your obligation and duty to have a meeting with me to discuss these problems. Never got a response back from her. <coughs> the uh, it's, it's like the staff person who took the photographs coming in me driving into my property. Whoever it was had to climb up a very steep rocky slope in the dark because planning told us the guy was out there 5.30 in the morning and it was dark at 5.30 in the morning. Climbed up the top of the property, is on my property, waiting for us to come in. Now, I come driving in at quarter to seven, and I get by a violation for stepping foot on my property. What planning is telling me is, I am not allowed to use my property for anything other than mining outside the time limits of 7 a.m., to 7 p.m. five days a week, Monday through Friday. That means if I want to go up there on a Saturday, take five people, have a barbecue alongside the creek or something, I am not allowed to do it. I'm not allowed to step foot on my property outside those hours. Now, the U.S. Constitution has a lot to say about property rights. That's an illegal seizure and taking of my property without my consent. So, <clears throat> here, these, these violations, all of this stuff from day one, I've had a problem. I've tried to deal with it. I, whatever county wants, there's Pat Richards there. He was a reasonable man to deal with. He's a hard guy because some of the things that he wanted me to do, I disagreed with. But I did what he wanted me to do because I felt he was fair and reasonable. We had no problems. Pat left. All of this start, stuff starts ratcheting up. Just to big balloon. Here, all of these violations. On the violations, the thing happened here six, eight months ago. And then, oh... County needs more violations, so let's write another violation today. If it was a violation six months ago, why didn't they write the violation six months ago? You know, it, 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 I wouldn't do that. If, if I thought it was a violation, I, that's what I would do. Why wait six, eight months to package them all together and hit me with all of this stuff? But here, one of the ones was, we have stopped the trucks. I would assume all of you people are familiar with Stop the Trucks. They have one objective, to stop all trucks in Ojai. So what we should do is stop all the gasoline delivery trucks, all the bonds market trucks, stop them all if we're going to stop the trucks. But what they are doing, any truck that they see in Ojai, they say it comes from Ozina or it comes from Mosler. And boom, there it is, right out of violation, and it's just planning gets ten, viola ten complaints a day from stop to truck. Here, the, the one the big one that I got from planning violation, it listed like ten different days, ten different trucks. Or not ten different days, like ten different trucks. 4.30 in the morning, a double hopper truck going north was spotted, was spotted uh, around Vaughn's Market there at 33 and 150, going north on Highway 33. It had to be going to Ojai Quarry at 4.30 in the morning, and I'm getting violation for being 
driving onto my property at quarter till seven in the morning. What? Why would I have a truck at four thirty in the morning? Then I go to my trucker, Tri County Transportation. They look through their records. Yeah, that was one of their trucks going up to Ozina or going to going up to Diamond Rock or wherever it's going up there. You know, and then Louie gave me the list, each truck that was his truck that was going north. And then I had, like, out of that whole list, I think I had three trucks that went to me. So we have a situation here that... Excuse me, Mr. Moses, would you move over in front of the microphones? Because, so we, we sure want to get this on tape. Thank you. Go ahead. I'm not speaking loud enough. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> um... So we had three of my trucks that were potentially in question or whatever, but I have to defend myself against the other seven trucks that clearly had nothing to do with me. Only in Ventura County and only in America are you guilty until you are proven innocent. Here, I am guilty of all of this just because the planning department says oh here's the violation I'm guilty now I have to spend here they run up a bill of eight thousand dollars to that they want me to pay and then I've got a bill of probably twenty thirty thousand that I have to pay to defend myself the US Constitution says in America you're innocent until you're proven guilty I don't know where that concept has gotten lost here, but apparently it has gotten lost. Now, I am the smallest mine in this county, and I am being ground up the hardest. And if you look at the documents that we have provided, the documents speak for themselves. I was told to do something. I did it. My condition says remove the perch boulders. The federal government says remove the perch boulders. Planning says no. What are you supposed to do? So all I am trying to do is operate a business, keep people safe, abide by the rules and regulations, but I'm being crucified for it. Now, then another good one here is I have a condition that says you cannot have any of your trucks go past Nordoff High School between 8 a.m. in the morning, 8 and 9 a.m. Now, school is in session at 8 a.m. If anybody that wrote this condition had any brains at all, they would have realized, well, they don't want trucks going by when school, kids are starting to come to school, and that's like 7 until 8. But they wrote it from 8 until 9. Kids are already in school. Now, when I drive by Nordoff High School, nowhere on 33 do I see a big sign that says, all trucks are banned from driving past uh, school between the hours of 8 and 9 a.m. There's no sign that says that. Only planning is saying that my trucks can do this. Once my trucks leave that quarry, they are on public highway. California Vehicle Code controls the public highway. Caltrans controls the public highway. Ventura County Planning Department doesn't control it. Now, there are five federal lawsuits that we have that have dealt with cities, counties, municipalities trying to control truck trips out of mines and quarries and whatnot. They've all lost. Federal Aviation Commission lawsuit was the biggest one. The suits say you can't control the number of vehicles going in and out of a business. It's illegal because it's only Federal Highway Department states can control that. Steve Bennett wanted to have a 
truck restriction put on Highway 33. So it was two years ago, I believe it was. He takes and asks Caltrans to do a safety study on Highway 33. Caltrans takes six months or however long they've taken to do this. They did this safety study. They submitted the results to Bennett. Bennett held on to the results, and the only way he finally let loose of them and when he was forced, he was going to go to a, free, a document request to get the results. Then he released them. In the report, it's like a 10, 15 page report. Caltrans says, the problems don't lie with the trucks. The problems lie with the speeding cars and motorcycles. If the trucks are legal trucks, operate legally on the road, that road is meant to take commerce from this side of the mountain to Bakersfield. Then it said, clearly stated in this, that municipalities like to try to restrict trucks from roads because it's a political politically correct thing to do to appease constituents. He says there's a process in place to do that. They listed the name, phone number, and address and everything of the office that Caltrans has to submit an application to have a restriction put on a highway. And then it says at the bottom, it lists the highways in this state that have those restrictions. There's like three short pieces of road that have those restrictions on them. Then it says this is an extremely difficult thing to do because you're interfering with interstate commerce and it's a federal issue and you're not allowed to do it. So here, even Caltrans told Bennett, you can't do this, but we're still doing it. My question is why? Do me, do me, do me, do I, as the smallest mine owner in the county, have to take up the gauntlet and file suit and take this to the federal courts to prove that the five previous lawsuits are in fact just and they will stand up and then the county is going to get off of my back and I can have more than 20 loads a day. Other, other mines, Grimes Canyon, Four and five hundred truck trips a day. I have twenty. Now the previous owner, if he could, when that CUP was written in '95, if he could have gotten out twenty loads in one day, he would have had. He felt he'd struck it rich, because it, it'd be luck, he, He's lucky to get out five loads a day. But you know, I've cleaned the place up. I've made room. I've done improvements. I've done all of these things. And the irony of the whole thing is. There's more people in Ojai that want this material than are members of Stop the Trucks that don't want any trucks. I've taken up more time than whatever. But I, all I am asking is hear what we are saying and then read the documents. Judge taught me years and years ago. He said, son, documents speak for themselves. What the document says, that's what it means. It's not, well, I thought it meant this, or I interpret it to mean this, or you interpret it to mean that. The doc what the document says, that's what it means. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mosler. Uh, the next card I have is uh, Pat Richards. Would you state your name and address, please? In fact, this is, this is the last card I have for people supporting the appeal. Uh, thank you, uh, members of the commission. My name is uh, Patrick Richards, 4291 Blackberry Lane, uh, Sonos, California. Um, mainly, I just wanted to uh, introduce myself for the record to uh, identify that um, my role with regards to the Ojai uh, Quarry is to try to facilitate uh, resolution of the violations, uh, try and uh, look at uh, other matters that uh, are embodied within the conditions that. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mosler and the Ojai Quarry need to attend to. Uh, I am uh, the resource uh, for Mr. Mosler. 
I'm here today to, again, to act as a resource for the Commission if they should have any background uh, questions uh, regarding uh, past uh, activities or uh, actions uh, uh, pertaining to this particular appeal. Uh, one of, uh, as a former county employee uh, with the Planning Division, uh, one of my responsibilities was to manage the uh, SMARA program. So with that said, um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Richards. Uh, Commissioner Dukas? So um, were you um, with the county in 1995 when the CUP was first issued? Did you have anything to do with the um, issuance of the CUP in 95? Uh, no, I Okay. Um, there's equipment lists, the ones that were okayed by the original CUP, and then what's going on there now. Could you explain a little bit about the process that you would have to go through in order to add equipment uh, to uh, a conditional use permit of this type? Well, many of the buy-ins did not specifically call out a um, uh, particular type of equipment, so this was a, a little bit of an unusual situation. Um, and I'm going by memory because you have to remember I, I left the county uh, two years ago. Um, the equipment list, uh, I remember, was reviewed and uh, uh, the specifics as to the surroundings, uh, I really can't remember exactly. But uh, the appearance is that it was reviewed. Uh, it appeared to be uh, within the nominal provisions of the mining operation of a mine of that size and was probably simply just placed uh, in the file, or in essence received and accepted. Um, in hindsight, uh, the in all likelihood, should have been documentation back to uh, the Ohio Quarry to acknowledge uh, that uh, uh, you know, that uh, the information was received and accepted. Um, I don't believe that that document uh, uh, exists, that reply document exists. Would, in your opinion, would it be reasonable to, to have, um, to have to have like changes to your CUP in order to get new equipment for your operation? Matter, matters um, such as uh, revised equipment list uh, was typically processed under a permit adjustment uh, process, which is the lowest uh, permitting uh, process. It's permit adjustment, minor modifications, and then major modification process. Uh, the only really salient difference between uh, uh, those provisions is that permit adjustment does not require a uh, public hearing. Minor modifications and major, major modifications require a public hearing. Um, permit adjustments uh, are appealable um, should anybody choose to to appeal that but uh, that probably would have been the uh, the course of action if that was the only circumstances that were that at that time uh, the staff was dealing with and would that be something that the county would do or would that be something no, that the permittee would have to do the permittee the applicant the mine operator would do that okay so the the delay with the um, 2007 equipment list that was his ball to carry? Well, unless the county advised them, uh, the operator, that uh, in order to um, officiate the change uh, by a permit adjustment, the operator would not know. And again, since there doesn't appear to be correspondence that followed the receipt of that uh, documentation, um, then the operator would not have knowledge that that was the request of the uh, uh, county at that point in time. Okay. Um, regarding uh, the truck limits, um, do you see any um, reason why the county would be interested or intended to limit the productivity of a mine? There's a distinction being made between product trucks and trucks. Oh, and I'm yeah. not buying it. <laughs> I just don't see, I, the, maybe this is conclusory and inappropriate, but um, I'm having trouble following the reasoning why the county would limit the productivity of a mine and say, well, you, you can only get this much. Well, the county traditionally uh, limits truck trips. Um, that's usually a, a provision of uh, impact to uh, uh, the local roadway system, um, depending upon where there uh, are uh, congestion problems, um, uh, average daily trips is the uh, 
the, the moniker that's, that's generally used. Um, so the county has traditionally said there is a limitation. The applicant during a process, whether it be a, a new uh, mine or uh, one that's up for a uh, continuation, um, usually at that point in time they, they put forth what they want as um, uh, the, the number of trips and then that's evaluated uh, uh, typically through a traffic study. And so there's justification that the roadway system can support that number of, of uh, vehicle trips. Uh, and I'm, I'm a little un unclear as to, as to the question, if, if, the, if you're talking about the word product, um, that's, that's an anomaly. I don't, I don't believe that other mines have that particular uh, 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 identification uh, on it. Uh, what was the mindset at the time that uh, the staff had created that? Uh, I have no idea. Um, what was the mindset of the Planning Commission that approved it at that point in time? No idea. Um, why they specifically did that? There must have been a, uh, a reason or a purpose uh, in doing that, but uh, it's not clear in the record what, uh, what that was. Okay, thank you for that. Sure. Uh, while, you're, while you're there, Mr. Richard, you just said the county traditionally limits truck traffic, and the county also limits the traffic on Highway 33, they can't, the level of service is so great that you can't build anything that puts one more car on 33. So can we assume from your statement that the county has a right to limit trucks on Highway 33 going through OI? Uh, I'll leave that to the attorneys to uh, argue, okay. Mr. Mulligan. But But it is happening, and it's not just happening to Muslim mines. Um, and it's happening not only on Highway 33, but uh, uh, Highway 118 uh, comes to mind. There are other highways that are impacted by traffic in which the county does regulate uh, and limits the, uh, uh, the use, the land use uh, for uh, the number of uh, vehicle trips that it can generate and not have an impact on the highway. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Richards. I have no other speaker card, so... I thought at this point, uh, before, and I have no speaker cards for people who are against, pardon me, against the appeal. So at this point, I would like to, with the Commission's approval, deal with questions that we have from the appellant. Is that fine with you? Okay. Uh, who would like to start? No? Uh, that's okay? If you say so. Okay. Because you will have a chance for a rebuttal at the end. Uh, are these questions for Ms. McGee? Or the... Planning director? Or? Yes, to all of the above. <laughs> all right. You want to start, Commissioner Dukas? Or Commissioner Onsat? We have heard he has a obligation from several sources to remove dangerous boulders. I'm sure it's in everyone's best interest that that happened. Do we, is there any evidence to support that while doing that, he was actually removing material for the purposes of sale? Well, I'm going to take a quick trip back to my PowerPoint so you can get some visuals here. Um, I think it's a good idea to take a look at what we're seeing, um, I mean, what we're talking about. Do you have the, um, the appellant's presentation? Okay, so I think he had a map, but that's okay. I'll just use this one. <clears throat> okay, so um, we don't have a, any, let's say, receipts that this material was sold. But if you can see in this area here, this was... Okay, there was a rock failure here, and I think Mr. Mossler talked 
um, about that, and that is a natural occurring thing. Um, but in here, in the 1.3 acres of disturbance, there was a perch boulder that um, would not have, it's in our opinion, would not require 1.3 acres of disturbance to remove it. Um, and it is in our opinion that those rocks being removed from the site are being used for commercial purposes. Um, in addition, the... Was there a danger there? Yes, according there was to the right. Mine Safety um, and Health Administration. And this system. occurred during his ownership as opposed to a previous ownership? Yes. A, a lot of these existed in both times. Okay. Um, and we agree that they totally need to be removed. Okay. Um, there's just a process in which that has to happen. And Mr. Mosser spoke to all the regulatory agencies' requirements. And that happens a lot on mine sites. You have a lot of acres. You have a lot of issues. Um, a lot of regulatory agencies require different things, and it's our, um, well, it's the operator's responsibility to coordinate all of those. Um, if you look at the 1.3 acres, um, I think Mr. Cole talked about the amended reclamation plan addressing that 1.3 acres. Um, I want to speak a little bit to that, but since it's before the State Mining and Geology Board, it's really not a matter of today's discussion. But the 1.3 acres on the reclamation plan also included an additional 1.6 areas acres to be disturbed, which I can't speak to what happened with previous staff, but if you review the topographic maps and the plan that was submitted, it clearly shows additional acres being disturbed. So that gave us, um, that, told, that indicated to us that not only was the 1.3 acres um, being already disturbed, but they plan to do an additional 1.6 mining uh, acres in mining area. Well, did they actually do it? They have not done it yet. We okay. have not approved that plan, and again, that's before the State Mining and Geology Board. If someone removes something like that, what are they supposed to do with it after they remove it if they're not going to break it up and sell it? Generally, that's what happens. They break it up and sell it. But, okay, was it, in addition to removing the obstacle, did they do any additional mining in that area? It is our understanding that that did happen. Um, some you of know that that happened. Hey, excuse me, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Commissioner Onstott. Um, uh, before I speak, I have to issue my own uh, disclaimer. Uh, I am a sitting member of the State Mining and Geology Board. However, uh, I will not be uh, uh, serving in that capacity uh, when this matter goes to the Mining Board. I will be out of the room and not involved in any way in any kind of uh, mining issue involving Ventura County. That being said, um, I've served six years on the Mining Board. I've been dealing with smart issues since 1990. And, and I, I would tell you that the, uh, the issue before you today are, are rather simple. Number one, um, the state definition in the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act of mining and mined lands, that's sections 2729 and 2735 of the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act, which is Public Resources Code, uh, clearly defines what is mining and what is mining operations. And uh, even the removal of the boulders and any incidental surface work is mining. So all the activities, including the creation of roads, that is mining. So the, the question today is has this mine operated within the boundaries of their approved reclamation plan and also has this mine operated within the boundaries of their approved conditional use permit they can, and it's not it's actually not even a, a zoning ordinance issue uh, the the uh, conditional use permit that was granted to the original holder of this permit uh, received an exception to zoning that's what a conditional use permit is and that mining was allowed subject to the conditions that were included in the grant of approval and so the, the issue today is, is this operation in conformance with its conditions of approval? And, of course, another overriding issue is, is this operation, has it been, mining been conducted uh, such that it can be, re, such that the site can be reclaimed in accordance with its approved reclamation plan? Well, as it is today, neither of those uh, can happen. So uh, there, there really is no uh, controversy over what constitutes mining, even the removal of boulders, that is incidental surface work, uh, that is a mining activity. And so it's not that, um, that we would disagree with MSHAW that something has to be done, but included in those things is compliance with all laws and regulations, including amending your conditional use permit to accommodate this additional disturbance and amending your reclamation plan to accommodate this additional disturbance and to modify it. 
and 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 I think the uh, the notice of violations that have been issued are because the operator is working with other agencies and not this agency, and it is that they're required to comply with all laws, not those they choose. So your position, he should seek a modification of the existing permit. Uh, absolutely. If they want to do something other than was authorized in the original conditional use permit, they can seek a modification. As part of seeking that modification, they need to pay the uh, bill of the county staff time that it takes to process this modification. And uh, and 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 commonly, it's it's uh, you know every mining operation in the state by law must be inspected annually. And it's very common that uh, you know mistakes happen out in the field, and someone mines outside of their approved boundary then they need to file in a timely manner for an, a, an amended reclamation plan. And, uh, and along with that, uh, as provided under the law, they need to pay all of the lead agency's costs for processing that reclamation plan. If the mine is not vested and is operating under a conditional use permit, they need to also amend their conditional use permit to reflect a new mining boundary and perhaps a new depth of mining. And so there's a lot of process. And, uh, and as far as, uh, you know, uh, you know the terms of the state highway and, and things like that. I don't think we regulate, uh, you know, how a vehicle is operated, but it's clearly within the county's authority in terms of granting an exception to zoning to have a CUP. Uh, and it's it's the case in virtually every type of project like that that you're limited in the number of truck trips because that's what was analyzed in the environmental document. Um, and I would point out that other mines, and even including the ones mentioned by Mr. Mosler. Uh, they're under a, a, a truck trip limit under their current permit. And now they're bigger mines and they have a bigger limit and they're in a different location and they have a different CUP. But that's that's the exception to zoning that was granted in that case. So uh, it, it, this case is very simple. Are they within their mining boundary as defined by their CUP and their approved reclamation plan? Uh, have they paid their bill as they're required to do by both county ordinance and state law? Uh, and can they reclaim the site in accordance with their current reclamation plan? So uh, it's staff's position that the answer to all three of those is no. And that's it. What is the status of the appeal and how does that impact this proceeding? Uh, are you referring to the appeal to the State Mining and Geology Board? Yes. Uh, it's the, uh, it's the, the right of any operator or any person who's applying for a reclamation plan uh, if they feel that the uh, lead agency, uh, that in this case the County of Ventura, has not taken action on that reclamation plan in a timely manner, they can appeal that inaction to the State Mining and Geology Board. Uh, now, when that appeal goes to the State Mining and Geology Board, uh, of which I will not be there, uh, the, uh, the issue uh, may be, okay, uh, the, the, uh, the local lead agency did not take timely action then the State Mining and Geology Board can determine that we will take the, sorry, I let a we out there, the Mining Board um, can take the action to say uh, that it will process the reclamation plan. However, the exact same standards apply to the processing of the reclamation plan. Uh, it's still subject to state law and SMARA and all its terms. And, and one thing I'll point out about uh, the county's ordinance uh, the chapter in the county zoning ordinance, which involves mining and reclamation, uh, that is a law that had to be certified by the State Mining and Geology Board for, in order for it to go into force. And uh, essentially the preamble of this is that all mining and reclamation uh, shall be done in accordance with the State Surface Mining and Reclamation Act. So all of the terms of the State Act are incorporated into the local ordinance and frankly, we wouldn't have a local ordinance that didn't include that because the mining board would not have certified it. And it's very similar in the situation, parallel universe is when the Coastal Commission certifies a coastal zoning ordinance. That's the, that's the parallel universe. So uh, this is very simple. Are they within their, their bounds? Have they paid their bill according to law? Can they reclaim according to their approved rec plan? And it's the staff analysis that the answer to all of those questions is no, and that uh, these notices of violation uh, reflect a period of time in which that answer has remained no. Thank and, you. And to further answer your question, um, Commissioner Onstott, the appeal is to be heard sometime in January by the State Mining and Geology Board. Uh, I, I hate to correct my uh, colleague, uh, Ms. Ms. McGee. Uh, the State Mining and Geology Board will not be meeting in January. I know that personally, but it would likely be in February. Thank you. 
update. Is that 2011 or 2012? 2011. Thank you. Just, just as a point of order, um, are we going to allow our, our Ms. Uh, McGee to do her full rebuttal and then take questions? Okay, very good. Thank you. Well, we probably should do that now then. Well, oh, hold up. I'd, I'd like to have everything asked of staff um, uh, that we need to ask and then have the appellant uh, make his rebuttal so he has, you know, he's not... Uh, blindsided by something that we haven't uh, addressed in a public hearing. Is, is that okay? Is, uh, Linda, is there, any, is there any problem with that? What, what uh, Commissioner, you want to say? I just want to address questions of, of staff before the appellant uh, makes his rebuttal so that, uh, so that the process is fair, in my opinion. Well, yeah, the chair can speak to that, whether he wants to follow that. I'll go along with that. Do you have any more questions? Go ahead. We can go back. Okay. Um, excuse me. What, what I was questioning is whether she could give her full rebuttal that would hopefully answer a lot of your questions, and then if we had remaining questions left between staff, we would be able to answer those, because that's traditionally the way that it's done, that we, we go through uh, the I rebuttal see. of what we've heard. I didn't understand that at, at first. So what you're asking is that she's going to do her rebuttal to... Mr. to the appellant and then she's going to answer his comments and you th and that may answer our question is that okay with you commission on if we do that go ahead okay thank you um, there are a couple points that I think are important to address and the first one was um, that staff hasn't really taken any time to meet with mr. Mosser to figure out what is what is necessary to um, abate all of these violations and that we haven't been helpful we have had to, we've set up meetings with Mr. Mosler that weren't attended. Um, we have sent several letters in the SMAR violation. We did include an abatement plan that outlined exactly how these violations could be um, abated, and um, none of those none of those um, abatement measures were met by Mr. Mosler. Um, in addition, um, he talked about the enforcement time spent, and that is true. We have spent couple hundred hours on um, enforcing the conditions um, as you know our system is complaint driven so this we get a lot of complaints for this quarry and therefore the research time to um, the research time used to um, investigate the violations as well as issue the citations review the conditions all that is um, part of the condition compliance agreement that mr. Mosler signed Um, also, um, another note was that a lot of the violations are complaint-driven, complaint but we actually did conduct our surface mining um, inspection, yearly inspection, and that's where we also noted violations. So those were direct staff observations. And we talked a little bit about the appeal before the board, but it was noted that it's, that the staff had not timely processed the appeal and that we took a 180 turn. Um, we gave them direction one way and then new staff gave them a direction another way. That, that didn't quite happen. What happened in the reclamation plan is it's submitted, it's then reviewed by staff and it's sent to the state mining and I'm sorry, the Office of Mine Reclamation for review and comment. That happened. The OMR made comments, sent it back under the false um, assumption that we determined that it was a substantial deviation from the original reclamation plan. When staff evaluated what was submitted, they evaluated the 1.38 um, areas area of disturbance right outside of the reclamation plan, and staff did note that that was not a substantial deviation. However, other maps were submitted in between those times that expand the actual mining boundary an additional 1.6 acres. OMR required an, ad an additional exhibit showing exactly what was being proposed at that time. We never got that from Mr. Mosler. We never processed anything because he never submitted anything. And as noted in the, in the letters that were written by um, previous staff, 
um, it was determined at that time, looking at aerials, that there was that what phase Mr. Mosler was in. But it appears to uh, to current staff that they were not looking at um, the topographic maps that were submitted, because in reading them, you can clearly see that where Mr. Mosler even proposed his reclamation to be on some of the exhibits was higher than what's there. So if the elevation, let's just say, is 1,300 and he's proposing 1,325, well, there's a discrepancy because he's already mined or disturbed lower than what's being proposed. So all of these issues need to be flushed out in the reclamation plan. And again, that's before the State Mining and Geology Board, but it is important that you know that. Um, as far as the equipment list is concerned, it is a requirement that a permit adjustment is submitted for the the exchange of the equipment. And there, this is a condition that's on a lot of the older mining sites that haven't had a lot of amendments to them. And generally the process is the, app, the operator submits a new list with a permit adjustment. And staff will process that permit adjustment and change the condition language to include either the new equipment list or whatever was proposed, as long as it meets, it's within, um, substantially meets the requirements of the current um, permit. Excuse me, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt this point. You said, did they submit? No, there has been no permit There is no permit to increase the number of equip, amount of equipment. For the 2007 list. Um, a few weeks ago, there was a permit adjustment submitted to amend the equipment list. However, because the zoning code does not pro permit us to process any type of permit when there's appeal pre um, pending, we couldn't accept it. Thank you. And just to clarify on that point, uh, Commissioner Chair, uh, just to explain what happened. Many times we would receive those notifications from Mr. Mosler either directly or via the Air Pollution Control District who would receive the notifications and the APCD would then notify us, just give us a heads up, oh, by the way, we received this uh, information about new equipment that uh, the Ojai Quarry is going to be operating out there. And there were never... Uh, permit adjustment applications submitted as part of those notifications. The only permit adjustment application that uh, the Ojai Quarry attempted to submit was by Mr. Richards after uh, the appeals had been filed. And once again, as it was indicated earlier, the code specifically says we cannot process any application, take any action on any application that is the subject of an appeal. So uh, we've informed both Mr. Cole and Mr. Mosler that we are willing to process a permit adjustment application. However, you got to drop your appeal. If not, we would be violating the code. Uh, let me just piggyback on that. If they had dropped the appeal and, and submitted it, would that prohibit them from appealing after that? They can appeal any decision that the planning director or staff makes on behalf of the planning director. So. Uh, if there was a decision rendered at that point, it would be subject to an appeal, so. Okay, yeah, thank you. Could you explain to me what the purpose of the equipment list is? I mean, what's the policy behind it? I can't speak for previous staff as why well. they put that condition on there, but um, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was a way for us to just regulate what was happening on the site. So, and you don't want to have a, a mining site with that we are we, we examine it to do one thing one sort of thing in this case that's what happened Mosser um, bought the site from a operator who like he said maybe had five truck trips so 20 wasn't a big deal it was a small operation um, in order for it to grow any bigger we would like to have some type of regulatory authority over that so um, the, the equipment list was just one of those ways for staff to evaluate what was going on on site we, don't, we currently don't have that condition language um, like mirroring that, that exactly, but we do say anything that you have on site needs to, um, whatever you have reflected on your site plan is what's going to happen on site. So if you have a rock crusher, a processing plant, that's what we expect to be out there. We don't expect to come out and you have eight processing, processing um, processors or crushers. Commissioner Onstott, just to piggyback on that too, uh, as you're aware, there was an environmental impact report prepared for this project, um, excuse me, this mining operation 
um, which was uh, prepared as a part of the last modification to it, which resulted in the conditions and the mitigation monitoring and reporting program. Um, the analysis and the environmental review is based upon the project descriptions that, that is presented at that point in time. So if there's a list of equipment the that's presented as a part of the project description, the environmental review is going to be based upon that. So when we're analyzing things like air quality impacts, we are basing the analysis on the assumption that only those, the equipment stated in that project description is what, in fact, is going to be operated out there. So you have to either lock in in the project description the number and types of pieces of equipment or you would have to place a mitigation measure or a condition of approval on a permit such that it locks in that equipment in so that it doesn't compromise the analysis of the environmental review, if that makes sense. It does. Thank yeah. you. I'm sorry. I've been guilty of also interrupting you before you've had a chance to complete your comments to where the appellant Wish to continue, or ha have you finished your comments? No, we have, I have a couple more things. I think Dan touched on the environmental analysis um, part, but there is a section in our code that states that um, any project has to work in harmony with the environment, and that is what we are asking to have happen here. In um, Mr. Mosler opposed doing an amendment to his conditional use permit, um, and agrees to the amendment to the reclamation plan. Well, the reclamation plan is part of the conditional use permit, and those two need to um, work in harmony with the environment. So anything outside of um, what was originally permitted has to have a change to both the reclamation plan to ensure compliance with SMARA and reclamation standards and the conditional use permit so we can evaluate that as well. Um, I believe that was everything. Dan, did you have anything? Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the Commission, um, uh, the basic mining scheme in the state of California is that it, you are, if you're going to operate a mine, it requires you to have three things. A local permit to mine, that's from the local lead agency, uh, that is if your local city or county has, uh, has had certified a mining ordinance and they are now acting as a lead agency. Uh, so you have to have a local permit to mine, which is generally a conditional use permit. You have to have a reclamation plan, uh, an approved reclamation plan, which is approved by both the local lead agency and in coordination with the uh, State Department of Conservation uh, Office of Mine Reclamation. And then you have to have a financial assurance, which is adequate to uh, uh, reclaim the site uh, in accordance with the approved reclamation plan. Uh, and so. Uh, each one of those items is separate. Uh, it, you know, whenever you have a CUP for mining, you will always have a reclamation plan. However, they're under different laws and involve different decision makers. So, uh, but you have to be, you have to have each one of those things in order to operate a mine. And, and of course, if you modify a mine, you have to modify all three of those things. And, uh, and of course, especially a financial assurance, uh, that's required to be updated annually in order to account for the current condition of the site. Uh, and whatever disturbance you are proposing to do for the following year so that there's always a financial assurance held by the state and the county uh, in order to, in case the operator in the middle of the night departs the site, there's adequate funds to reclaim the site and uh, avoid any environmental or um, you know, public health and safety hazards. One other point that was brought out in the presentation was the Nordoff High School restriction. The condition, just for clarification, the condition actually says that no trucks can go through the city of Ojai between 8 a.m. and 9 o'clock while Nordoff High School is in session. Nordoff High School being um, the beginning of the city boundaries. So um, that condition was more so to limit truck travel through the city of Ojai, not necessarily Nordoff High School. Um, and furthermore, uh, I think Mr. Mosler said it best when he said let the documents speak for themselves because all of these conditions is what he signed up for. I agree with him. Um, I look at mining plans regularly. The bottom to top approach is similar to if you were holding a pillar of sand. If you take it from a pinch off the top, you don't have instability. But if you try to take a handful off the bottom, it's going to crumble. We agree. Staff agrees with, with him that that is a poor mining plan. However, in order for him to amend that plan, he's going to have to go through the local process to do so. 
I'm not clear about the trucks going through town. So they can go by Nordhoff High School between 8 and 9? They cannot go through the city of Ojai between from 8 and 9. So it's not just Nordhoff High School? It's not just Nordhoff High School, but um, it's while Nordhoff High School is in session. Okay, so the trucks could come down Highway 33, go by Nordhoff High School, and keep going down 33 toward minor, toward uh, Ventura? They can't go through the city of Ojai between 8 and 9 at all while Nordhoff High School is in session. So let's just say well, Nordhoff just High School is on a spring break, then they can go through okay. 8 and 9. Yeah, okay. and just to make that clear, if you turn to page 355 of your Planning Commission packet, look at condition number 40, subsection B, which is the condition you're questioning right now. The first sentence states, quote, the loaded product truck shall be prohibited from driving through the city of Ojai between the hours of 8 a.m. and 9 a.m. on weekdays. This requirement, however, does not apply on days when Nordoff High School is not in session. I think that's a slide, too. It's right here, too, on the slide. These are the, and this is the city limits. So you can see this, the little school bus here. That represents Nordoff High School, which is more the boundary, the beginning of the city of Ojai. Okay. Just, just to um, have the staff being able to, to finish, I have, I have an important point that I, I want to make, and then Dan wants to conclude with the notes that he made on his rebuttal, too. I really want to be clear on the point that the county um, has the right to condition permit issuance upon state highway travel restrictions. I think that's very important, and uh, it's so important that we actually included the minute order from the Superior Court of California to your exhibit, Exhibit 11, and that is an attachment. And I just want to read you on the last page of that what Judge Reasoner had to say. And it says, um, this is the second to the last paragraph, further under CEQA, the California Environmental Quality Act, any public project in the form of a conditional use permit is required to mitigate the project's potentially significant impacts, including those impacts upon the state highways. It would be anomalous to undercut the integrity of the CEQA of CEQA by foreclosing a lead agency after consultation with the State Transportation Agency from the ability to mitigate project-specific traffic impacts upon a state highway. That's a trial court decision. Is that right? That is clear, yes. Trial court. Mr. Cole, do you have any appellate authority to the contrary? There has been... Commissioner Allen, there's not been any. Wait, 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 wait. Let's. All right. Yeah. Commissioner let's, let's hold that, Commissioner Allen. Dan, you had, a, you, you had a comment. Dan? Yes, I just wanted to clarify uh, regarding the trespassing accusations. Uh, staff did go out but did not place one foot on Mr. Mosler's property. Those photos were not taken from his property. We were invited by a neighbor to go out, make the observations of the mine, and uh, it just so happened to be that the one day that we sent staff out there to do the observations from the neighboring property, we observed these activities prior to 7 a.m. Um, we are not, the notice of violation was not intended to state that Mr. Mosler going to, onto the property before 7 a.m. is a violation. That was not the violation. The violation were the trucks going onto the property. If you read the condition, it's pretty clear. All operations of that mine are only to be conducted between 7 a.m. 7 a.m. 7 p.m. 10 minutes before 7 a.m. It's minor, but the fact of the matter is, we are receiving complaints, quite a few complaints about the operations of that mine. We went out and investigated it, and the one day we got there, we happened to observe a violation. Period, and it was not conducted by trespassing on Mr. Mosler's property. Thank you for that. So am I to understand then that Mr. Mosler is able to access his property outside his um, permit hours? Sure, yes. Uh, per, uh, personal trucks going out there, conducting, uh, you know, going onto the site, uh, which don't result in mining operations occurring. Yeah, we, have, we don't believe that that condition was intended to regulate those sorts of activities. So if he wants to have a barbecue on Saturday, he can do that on his property? 
Sure, that's not a mining operation. Which well, that's okay. not mining activity. That's subject to the conditions oh, of the It's just the mining activities are <laughs> restricted to the five days a week, seven to seven. That's correct. Right. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Mr. Right. Chair. Yes. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the commission, um, there there was a, a, a statement there, and I just want to clear up any implication. Uh, Mr. Mosler purchased the property five years ago. And, uh, and there apparently was uh, mining activities and disturbance outside of the approved limits uh, prior to that time. Uh, well, a property transaction doesn't change the fact that a violation exists. And when someone purchases property, they accept both the benefits and the liabilities thereof. And so whether he personally did the violation to mine outside of his boundary, it doesn't really matter. He purchased the mine, and the mine operator and owner is responsible for those violations. So they don't they aren't extinguished by a property transaction. Thank you. Uh, I think we'll continue with questions to Ms. McGee. I have a question. Go ahead. Continue. Much has much has been made about the distinction in the number of trips regarding quote product trucks. Could you discuss that issue, please, in, in county's interpretation of what product truck means? In our in staff's interpretation, product was used when the time the condition was written as a generic term for any material leaving the site. So material leaving the site, product of the mine. Um, further, further review of the environmental report talks about truck trips, and it's limited to 20 truck trips. So the mine is permitted to have 20 round trip truck trips. Um, whether Whatever's in them is irrelevant. They can have 20 trucks leaving the site. Is there a similar distinction to the other mines? Do they have this language in it? I believe one other mine may have the permit condition using product instead of material. Um, but as far as we're concerned and as far as um, we, in our interpretation of that condition, it's always been any material leaving the site. Uh, Ms. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, Commissioner Onstott, I'd just like to point out in the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act, and this is uh, section uh, 2714, um, C, or excuse me, 2714D. Uh, this has to do with uh, the applicability of the Service Mining and Reclamation Act, and it exempts from the act, and I'll just read the sentence here, uh, prospecting for or the extraction of minerals for commercial purposes and the removal of overburden in total amounts of less than 1,000 cubic yards in any one location of one acre or less. That's, that's the de minimis ex, uh, exemption. Well, obviously, if you're more than that, it talks about removal of overburden. That is mining, and, and that if you are removing overburden of more than 1,000 cubic yards, you are subject to the act. So there really is no distinction between what is a uh, saleable product. If you're removing material from a site, you are mining, because the, the state is not going to get into the argument of what the price is you're getting for that material. If you're removing it, you're mining. Thank you. Commissioner Onstein, any other questions? You say that these enforcement proceedings are primarily complaint driven, although you have an obligation to obviously view the property. Are these complaints coming from any particular source or sources? Because implied here is there's some sort of political vendetta going on against this operation. Where do these complaints come from in general? Uh, no. <laughs> Buttons on. Stop. But yeah. Stop. <laughs> you know, yeah. complaints are are confidential to the county. So, you know, we can't really disclose where the complaints come from. That That is the confidential nature that we keep. Although we do say that, you know, complaints have been filed, but that is not the only thing that happens in a mining permit in the county, right? The, the mining uh, CUP is inspected every year right. for the requirements of SMARA. So whether it was complaint driven or not, complaint driven um, causes us to go out and and sit on a neighboring property and see if there's anything going on because we've been receiving the complaints. But the annual review that we do also has led to violations of the permit. So although we can't disclose where they came from, there has been a substantial number of complaints being filed. If I may follow up on Mr. Onset, had, can you disclose whether or not the volume of complaints since 2005 have risen, or you've seen a substantially large number in 2010? Uh, gosh, comparing to 2005, uh, 
from my memory, yes, the complaints definitely have increased, and they've actually increased in volume over the last uh, roughly 2009, 2010 years, um, particularly in regards to truck trip violations. But then they, they, they expanded, and we started receiving complaints regarding more of the other types of operational features of the mine, including the equipment. That was the subject of a complaint that was filed with us and other complaints regarding um, the number, you know, the times during which the trucks were traveling up and down and when they were operating. So they, they definitely have increased over the last two years. And that's not exclusive to uh, the Ojai Quarry. Uh, we've received a number of complaints regarding other uh, mining operations north of the quarry up in Lockwood Valley. And it's really, I think this is an important statistic, is the fact that uh, yes, the Mazar Quarry is a small mining operation when compared to other mining operations. Um, however, it, one, it has not been subject to the most complaints. There's another mine that has that regrettable honor. And then uh, number two, though, although it hasn't been subject to the most complaints, we have confirmed the most violations at this mine as compared to any of the other mining operations, regardless of size. So. Okay. It's just a point that was raised, and I, I just want to make that clear. This is this is not a vendetta. This is not a personal matter. We're responding to complaints. We have to do our job. When we get a complaint, we look at the law. We look at the complaint. We investigate it. If we have enough evidence where we believe that it corroborates that a violation, in fact, occurs, we're going to issue a violation. Okay. So if I can, <clears throat> on top of that, for, Mr. for your benefit, Mr. Ansat, we're going to be accepting into the record it's our Exhibit G, which is a formal complaint which it clearly states by the complaining party that they have filed over 100 complaints against the most of the quarry since January. So that is public record by the complaint. Thank you. I've got more. Mr. Mosler was complaining about the cost and expense associated with the county uh, participating in the appeal to the state alleging that the reason it was appealed to the state was that planning didn't evaluate the plan in a timely fashion. Could you elaborate or give me the county's position on that? Sure. Um, in 2008, August 8, 2008, the operator, Mr. Mosler, submitted an amended reclamation plan to county staff. Um, shortly thereafter, it was submitted to OMR for review and comment, and then again, OMR submitted those comments and required an amended plan. That's what we have um, been working with Mr. Mosler, attempting to work with Mr. Mosler to get this comprehensive plan because what was originally submitted was not um, adequate for us or the state. Um, with that said, there, has, there was an appeal filed um, with the State Mining and Geology Board and um, all of those, all of the charges that we have to review anything that goes to them or phone calls, research, we do bill Mr. Mosler for that because he, he made the appeal. So um, while we would like to resolve it at a staff level, and that could have happened if he was cooperative and submitted what we, the documents that we required, the studies, et cetera, et cetera, um, then we could have resolved it at a staff level, but he did not do that. He went to the State Mining and Geology Board. Um, the same with the injunction. He filed an injunction against us for doing SMARA, um, enforcing SMARA, as well as there's a, law, a lawsuit. So um, the injunction was thrown out, was denied, and because he has not um, exercised his administrative remedies. And one of those is working with staff to resolve this issue, which he has not done. Can anything be Im implied by the state taking this appeal? I would have to um, let our representative here um, speak to that. Um, the, uh, the State Mining and Geology Board does not work by implication. Uh, the uh, the uh, only thing that, uh, I mean, the, the decision to accept an, or at least hear an appeal uh, is made by the chairman. And, uh, and in this case, the chairman obviously decided that it would be, it'd be worthwhile for the mining board to hear it. That doesn't mean the mining board will actually take any action. They may decide not to do anything. So it's discretionary? That, oh, absolutely. Okay. No, go ahead. I'm through. Um, I'm skipping around through my notes. Okay. Um, Mr. Ma uh, 
the the appellant uh, uh, represented that Jensen Design and Survey said that the uh, the mine wasn't operating outside its uh, permitted removal area, and uh, you have uh, submitted these these aerial photographs. Um, what evidence besides the aerial photography uh, does the county have to, to show that he was operating outside his, uh, his removal area? Well, there's a couple things. One of them is the reclamation plan that was submitted, and I have a copy of that, but not for the overhead because it has topographic lines that are very difficult for you to see. But if you read the topographic map, you can see the elevations, and that's one thing that hasn't really been touched on. And it's not just the surface area of disturbance. It's actually the depth. So there are some areas within this mine today that are below what was even proposed on the reclamation plan. Um, I believed Mr. Cole had a copy of um, the reclamation plan that was submitted to the State Mining and Geology Board exhibit that showed the elevations on it. Um, our uh, engineering geologist, Jim Otusa, could also um, speak to that because we reviewed the plan and um, as Mr. Cole pointed out, some staff is not um, necessarily trained to read topographic maps. I reviewed them. I reviewed them with Mr. Um, Otusa, and we both agree that there is some mining that is deeper than what was proposed in the reclamation plan, the original reclamation plan, and the amended reclamation plan. Okay, so we can be satisfied that we have um, a, another expert opinion yes. that uh, – that there is uh, operations outside the permitted area, not just these uh, interpretations of aerial photos? Yes. Okay. Um, if you would like, we can call Mr. Otusta up to evaluate what he's seen on the plans that were submitted to him as well. No, so I just wanted to make sure that we weren't just looking at a, an aerial photograph okay. and thinking no. that we, we could no, we uh, interpret to. something from that. Yes, we look at the elevations as well. Um, Some of these questions have already been answered. Um, could you explain again about the timeliness of the, uh, uh, there's a, an accusation that, uh, that if there were violations, why weren't they uh, issued in a timely manner? How come he just got socked with this all at once? Well, given that some of the, uh, violations were in 2008. Yeah. We did issue one of the violations in 2008. It was not appealed, but nothing happened with it, um, and that was mining outside of the boundaries. Annually, as we've stated, you're supposed to do a um, SMAR inspection. The previous SMAR coordinator was to go out, evaluate the site conditions, make a report to both um, our internal um, management team as well as OMR. Those violations were not noted. That was an error in staff um, interpretation of what was happening on site. Um, to that, when we did our inspection last year, we we did noti notify the state that there are violations. We have notified management there are violations. And again, a lot of the violations that came in 2009 were complaint driven, but some of them were based off of our SMAR inspection. So why previous staff did not issue the violations? I can't speak to that. Um, maybe Mr. Richards could since he was there. Okay. Well, you know, in some of this we've got uh, conflicting um, uh, testimony, and I just wanted to chase that down and find out. Um, so there's no argument that that was so. That was so. And, well, a lot of these violations, like Mr. Baca said, they, have, they came with the land. Mr. Mosler may not have actively committed these areas, but or mine these areas, but he, they are subject to the property, and now he's subject to the violations. I get it. Okay, and my, my last uh, questions are to the attorney, county counsel. Okay, um, I'm, I'm concerned uh, uh, about this uh, perception that uh, Mr. Mosler is uh, assumed guilty and he has to prove himself innocent. 
Um, uh, he said that, that he said in his testimony that he was, he was guilty and he had to prove himself innocent. That there was this, um, you know, he's a violator and he's a, and, uh, a killer of fish and, um, you know, all this other stuff and that he, pr he has to prove that he doesn't. Could you speak a little bit to the, to the process of, of, uh, what his, um, what the assumptions are and what his redress is if, uh, you know, the different avenues um, to, um, to get this worked out? Well, it started, I think it's probably best to start at the beginning from what I know. I just know what you know from reading the staff reports. The staff has gone out, they've received complaints, they've apparently investigated the complaints, and they have opined and based on the evidence before them and that you've heard today and in the staff report that there's been um, a number of violations and they've documented those violations and now Mr. Mossler has appealed those violations and now he is presenting evidence to say those violations didn't occur. So what's really before you right now is to decide he's not guilty, he's challenging those violations and he's putting on evidence and you're going to decide did those violations occur or did they not occur? And at the end of this hearing, you'll either uphold his appeal and say, no, we don't find that there was evidence that those, those violations occurred, or you'll find that um, they did, or, you know, we can get into some of the legal issues, but strictly talking about from a factual basis right now. And then from that point, he has uh, an option to appeal your decisions to the Board of Supervisors, and from there, he ultimately can go to court and file a writ of mandate and say that, you know, whatever final decision-making body, what if it goes to the board, what they finally decided um, was an abuse of discretion or not. But, you no, know, he's not proven uh, guilt, assumed to be guilty. The, you have to, you as, that's what you're the planning commission is doing here. You're looking at the evidence as to whether a violation occurred or did not occur. Thank you very much. Commissioner Westner. Yes, real quick, just two simple questions. First of all, since we have a resident expert from state mining, I appreciate that. Is there a term of art or a definition to the term product trips that's been defined? Uh, Commissioner Westner, uh, through the chair, uh, I, I don't think that would be uh, something that would be capitalized. Okay. So, in other words, there's no term of art that a lot of us do in our own professions, nor is it defined as far as you know anywhere in the State Mining Act. No, no. And, and as I said earlier, uh, the, uh, the, the, the preamble to the law, which is the section which says whether you're subject to it or not, uh, refers to the removal of either uh, mine material or, or overburden, product or overburden. So, so there really is no difference. If you're removing overburden from a site and it exceeds 1,000 cubic yards, you've just engaged in a mining operation whether you argue that it's not valuable or not. It's the act of removal of more than 1,000 cubic yards which trips the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act. So the mine Prior to that, you're just doing grading. So then my understanding is then the staff's position is that they base the trips in the, based on the environmental impact report on traffic. Uh, well, I mean, uh, part of the approval of the CUP, that was the analysis in the uh, document. If there's going to be some alternative that, re that would involve additional trips, that would have to be uh, analyzed in an amended environmental document. Okay. Uh, my last question is, uh, we've heard testimony of the equipment list was presented, uh, 06 and 07. Um, I've also heard the fact that at the time that the list would come here, since it's a discretionary approval by the planning director, that there should have been a permit modification submittal at the time. So what happens at the counter when this list comes up? It, was he requested for that modification, or do we know? In 2007, that did not happen. What happened was the equipment list was submitted directly to staff mm -hmm. and never um, applied for at the counter with a permit adjustment. But my question is, when somebody comes to the counter who's not that sophisticated, here's my equipment list according to the rules. At that time, is staff have the burden to advise them that they need the to application? For the permit. Yes, they should tell them that they need a permit adjustment to mine any condition, not just mining projects. Any condition requires a permit adjustment. All right, thank you. That's all I have. I just have one fast question, and then we'll, we'll take a short break before the appellant has a ch chance to rebut. Uh, were there any violations that have that 
Mr. Mosler corrected? I know some he couldn't correct because of the appeal. Were there any other violations that he has worked at to correct that he could at this point? County violations? Yes. Not to my knowledge. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's take about a five, ten minute break, and then, Mr. Cole, you are up.
You okay? Uh, Mr. Cole, during the break, someone submitted another card to speak. Okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll take that before you rebuttal. Thank you. All right, I have a card from his, I can't, is this Coleman Epstein? Is that who it is? You wish to speak now? Sure. Now, you checked the support recommended action. Are you, are you supporting the appeal or are you supporting the action of the county which is denied the appeal? Well, I think I'm supporting the county. You're supporting the county to deny the appeal? Yeah, I don't know the terminology here. But to, uh, Just essentially, go, go ahead and say what you want. Well, I'm the, uh, I'm the owner of the property, which is uh, 15450 Maricopa Highway, which is... I'm sorry, your name again. It's Mr. Coleman. What, would you state your name again as well as your address? Coleman Epstein. Okay, thank you. Go ahead. And uh, I border on, on my property line borders on the property line owned by the Rock Quarry by Graylar, uh, a north-south property line. And Graylar, uh, Rock Quarry, or whoever uh, is in control, has passed on, on, the, uh, on the east side of the property line into our property and has done mining on our property. He's taken rocks, he's taken material, and as described, uh, that uh, removal of rocks is, uh, is mining. He has therefore mined on my property. And I have uh, issued complaints to the county on this, and the county has, uh, has really not acted on my behalf on this. Uh, I don't know what else I should uh, say is that uh, pertinent to this uh, action that you have. Uh, uh, Mr. Epstein, when has this taken place? Pardon me? When has this mining taken place on your property? It started soon after 2005 when the new owner took over the property and uh, accelerated. Is it still going on? Pardon me? Is it still going on? Are they still mining on your property? They have uh, put a fence on my property. They have removed the rocks on my property. So I would assume that they are still doing active work, but I don't know. Okay. Thank you very much. Do you wish to say anything else? Uh, no. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Mr. Cole, uh, this, this is your uh, rebuttal. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair, members of the chair. A brief response. Uh, Mr. Epstein has a lawsuit pending against my client. Uh, we deny all of those allegations, um, and I'll just leave it at that. As for the issues that arose that, that we're here for today, um, I think what I have on the screen is the exhibit that we had prepared in our presentation. I realize you have to strain a little bit to look at that, and I apologize. But what you can see between 2004, which is a year before Mr. Mossler acquired, acquired the quarry property, and 2008, is that very little has changed in terms of the area that has been disturbed. Uh, what you have, frankly, is that not much, if anything, at the quarry has changed what has changed their staff's interpretations. And, and, and I'll elaborate on that, but basically what we have is a situation up until about last year, things were moving forward. Mr. Mossler was processing his amended reclamation plan. He did what staff had asked him to do. And then at that point, staff all of a sudden started changing its interpretation, telling us that they didn't, without really any explanation, that they needed new maps. They had the maps. The map that was referred to was provided to them well before they asked for it, and they had it. Uh, OMR, the Office of Mine Reclamation, never uh, did not send any word to the county that it couldn't process the uh, reclamation plan, that it, it needed a copy of a map that had already been provided to the county. So OMR never said, we can't do this. Um, you know, this, this reclamation plan is inadequate. That never happened. What happened is that staff's interpretation changed. And, and I want to go to another exhibit, this exhibit here. And I want to point out that in 2008, you have 101 hours that was devoted to Mr. Mossler's operation. Those issues, those 100 hours, I'm not going to say every single one of them, were related to this boundary issue. There was an extensive analysis that your staff did that led to the citation of Mr. Mossler in early February 2008 
for, for mining outside of his boundary. We didn't contest that citation. Mr. Mossler wanted to, but ultimately he, he worked with Mr. Richards and he moved forward with what staff had requested, which was to prepare an amended reclamation plan. But the, the, the image that I get listening to staff's presentation is that that analysis must have been perfunctory, it wasn't very complete, and you know nobody really looked at the issues, and then all of a sudden now things have changed, and so there's all of these new conditions on the ground that staff has to deal with that nobody dealt with. That is not true. If you look at that exhibit, 100 hours were spent in 2008. That, frankly, there were no trucking violations at that time that I'm aware of. The issue at that time was a boundary issue and was an issue with the reclamation plan. So I, 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 I fail to see how any staff could spend 100 hours doing a paltry job and not doing their job. So commissioners, what has happened is that staff has changed its position. It's not that the conditions at the quarry have changed, and I'll go back to this exhibit. It takes a while to call up the, uh, yeah, there we go. The conditions on the ground are essentially the same. Now, there has been mining that has gone on in the past four or five years, absolutely, but this is the smallest quarry in this county. This quarry has not produced more than 50,000 tons in any one year in that five-year period. Now, 50,000 tons to all of us may seem like a lot, but in a mining business, that is very, very small. The State Mines and Geology Board has issued what's called a small reclamation plan form, and that's the one that my client has used, indicating its understanding that something below 50,000 tons a year is a small mine. So you have a small mine that is limited in its truck trips and limited in its production. So very little has changed these last five years. But at the same time, as we go back to that exhibit I just showed you, your staff in 2008 and in 2009 spent a ton of hours working on this quarry. It's not as if they didn't do anything. It's not as if they said do this and didn't do their job, didn't do an engineering analysis. That's not true. So somewhere from that point, things changed. And obviously we're here today to talk about that, but I think that's the context that I really want to get through to this commission. The conditions haven't changed. It's the interpretation. Now, going to the boundary issue, and, and I appreciate and I respect Mr. Baca's comments uh, on the definition of mined lands and mining, and, and, and certainly as a member of the State Mines and Geology Board, he certainly has an intricate understanding of SMARA and what SMARA does. But SMARA is a reclamation statute principally. There are mineral conservation components of that law which are not applicable here, so it's really a reclamation statute. So yes, SMARA does define a surface mining operation to include things like stockpiling, to include things like haul roads, to include things that don't involve actual production. The reason being is that it is the policy of state law that every aspect of a mining operation needs to be reclaimed needs to be turned into something productive. Just The SMARA reclamation doesn't just occur in a quarry bowl or in a mining area. All of the processing areas have to be reclaimed. Even areas that uh, may have haul roads, those have to be reclaimed. So when you're looking at definitions in SMARA, those definitions are enacted with the idea that we want to maximize the extent to which operators must reclaim. Those definitions really do not have any bearing on the boundary issue that is presented today. And I'll, I'll ask that you look, I apologize that the county's exhibit is larger, but if you see those little colored lines, that's the phased mining areas. That is areas where there will be long-term production. In other words, you're going to get big quarry equipment literally digging out a hillside. And the mining plan, as Mr. Mossler explained, is to go from the top to the bottom. And so what, and it's a phased mining plan. So when you finish in one phase, the idea is that you would reclaim that phase before you go to the next phase. And that's important because that is, that is a very 
significant undertaking to, a, to phase, to reclaim an entire phase of mining, which is what Mr. Mossler will have to do when he's done mining in that area. You have to uh, recontour some of the lands. You may have to revegetate some of the lands. Uh, so that's a large undertaking. What's going on to the right of the areas that are shown by the red arrows that you see, excuse me, and then I'll show you the, the other red areas. To the right are the perched boulders. That, those are not mining per se. Now I will acknowledge for the record that once Mr. Mossler pulled those boulders down, he did run them through his crusher. And so I, those, I presume, went in with some saleable material. So yes, the boulders that were removed wound their way into uh, whatever jobs were filled the day they were crushed. But as far as actually long-term sustained pulling of material out of those areas, that hasn't happened. But more importantly, under the reclamation plan, the amended one that we've submitted that the county has not acted upon, those, at, those areas will be reclaimed. In other words, they will not ever be touched again for purposes of active mining. Mr. Mossler has no intent according to his current reclamation plan, to mine those areas. So what your staff is saying is that he needs to amend his phasing area to go into areas where he never intends to actually mine on a long-term basis simply because of this esoteric definition that they have of mining, which even if you accept it, it has zero practical uh, benefit whatsoever. And that's a point that, that I haven't heard your staff addressed. How is Mr. Mossler supposed to go mine an area? How is he supposed to include a phased area for mining when he doesn't intend to ever mine that area? The area that you see below, the area the arrow to the left, you see the road. That's a steep slope. And then he's got his processing area. He's never going to mine that area. He couldn't mine that area. So why do we need to amend the boundaries to include that area? We've tried to explain this to your staff. They've never listened. And I understand that, yes, we have exchanged phone conversations, we've had emails, but we've had a significant problem communicating. Uh, and, and perhaps it is my fault, and I'll accept responsibility if it is. But we've tried to explain these things, and, and they just don't get through. But what staff is asking makes absolutely no sense whatsoever. Now, this raises an issue that Mr. Baca did raise, is what about reclamation? Yes, the area needs to be reclaimed, absolutely. That is why and the area is shown with the red arrows. That is why Mr. Mossler submitted an amended reclamation plan. That is why Mr. Richards reviewed that reclamation plan. And not only did he review that reclamation plan, but there was an engineering analysis that I understand not only involved Mr. Mossler's engineer, but your own county geologist. And that involves probably a substantial part of those 100 hours I showed in 2008. So when, we, when I hear staff talking about all of these new things that they've come up with, that's their new interpretation. And on that point, I, I just heard for the first time today some analysis about how the contours of the reclamation plan are different. I've never heard that before today. And so I, I have to advise the commission, I, I am not in a position to adequately address that because that's never been raised to me. What we got were notices under SMARA that we're violating our reclamation plan and a notice to comply, which is essentially the beginning of the enforcement proceedings under SMARA. So we got these letters sort of from on high telling us we're in violation, but we've never actually had an explanation why our reclamation plan was not sufficient. The only explanation I can think of is what I just heard today, which there is a 25 foot difference between this contour and that contour. And, and if Mr. Otusa, your county geologist, has done a recent evaluation, fine. Uh, I'd certainly like to see that. And Mr. Mossler has a geologist and an engineer, and perhaps they can see that too. But, but this has never happened before today. And as far as the reclamation plan, Yes, the State Mines and Geology Board Chair has accepted that, but under the statute, the way the appeal statute is written, 
the only there are only two possible conclusions to that appeal. Number one is that the board, state mine and geology board, will approve the plan, and then that becomes the plan. The only other option is that they reject the plan, but they have to describe the specific aspects of the plan that need to be corrected, and then that gets submitted back to the lead agency. So there isn't any way for the State Mines and Geology Board under the statute governing these appeals to punt. So when we go before the State Mines and Geology Board in February, if that's when we're holding the hearing, which is still up, up in the air, um, the plan may be approved. And if it's not approved, the, this, the, the board will tell us the specific things that need to be corrected, and then we will correct those. But there's not any further discretion that the county has over the reclamation plan, and that is the consequence of the plan appeal being accepted. Uh, so I, I need to advise this commission of that, that, that that's a significant step. As for the remaining issues on the equipment list, there was a question, I don't know, Commissioner Onstott, if, if it was from you, but the idea was what is the policy behind having an equipment list? Um, I think the real policy from what I've seen in some other operations is to prevent operators from having equipment rental businesses. Uh, what a lot of, op well, not a lot, uh, what some operators will do is they'll park vehicles that are unrelated to their quarry activity and then they'll use those to transfer them to other operations or for their construction jobs. And, and what happens is you have all this heavy equipment coming onto the quarry that isn't necessary for the quarry operations, which creates an environmental impact. And they do that because these quarries are in wide open places. They have, you know, nobody's going to complain if, uh, if you have a big cat D8 or something sitting out on a quarry because that's what they expect to see there. So I, I think the, the intent of these is to stop operators from bringing on equipment that they don't need and that they use for other aspects of their business. Um, but in this situation, that's not the case. The equipment list that Mr. Mossler submitted are, in fact, the equipment that he needs to quarry. There's not excess equipment in there. And then also, as far as the environmental conditions, you're not going to trigger any new impact from what was studied before because... Uh, it's the same. It's quarry equipment. It's stuff that Mr. Mossler needs for his quarry. There was a, a question. Finally, well, two additional issues on the trucks. Um, and again, I, I think Commissioner Oz thought this may have been your question. There is no specific published appellate decision on quarry truck trip limitations. Um, vehicle Code Section 21. The annotations are fairly sparse. The annotations typically deal with uh, the few cases I've seen are uh, situations where cities tried to block off certain roads or do things like that, and it wasn't expressly authorized. And so the court said, if it's not expressly authorized in the vehicle code, you can't do it. And the most recent case that I can think of involved uh, the transportation of sludge from Los Angeles County to Kern County. There is a reported decision uh, I don't know that it's on all fours with the truck issue. I, I think it's persuasive authority. Uh, I, I, I see today that the court here, a trial court decision, um, has rendered some decision that's contrary. I, and, you know, quite frankly, I think that's incorrect because Vehicle Code Section 21 says local agencies may not adopt or enforce any ordinance that unless it's expressly authorized by the Vehicle Code. Well, the enforcement of... A surface mining ordinance is an enforcement of an ordinance under Section 21. The uh, enforcement of a zoning ordinance is enforcement of, of, of an um, ordinance under Section 21. But the issue will be litigated. I know I, just, just so the Commission understands, I'm active in the Trade Association for Mining Operations. I do a lot of work for operators, and this issue has come up. And quite frankly, the industry is looking for a way to litigate this issue, but it simply hasn't arisen yet. It will at some point. I hope that it doesn't have to be here, and that's, you know, we're trying to avoid that. But I think we've, we've laid out the legal issues on that, and I, I think, frankly, that's a legal issue that's going to have to be worked out. Um, finally, and then a concluding comment on the bill, um, the bill is simply put excessive beyond belief. Uh, it's not what, whether the, what the fees are. We acknowledge that we have to pay some fees. 
reasonable enforcement fees. Mr. Mossler does not dispute that. The cost, reasonable cost of an annual SMARA inspection, reasonable cost of code enforcement, we don't, we, we acknowledge that those costs have to be paid. But as we will address with staff and perhaps to this commission at a further date, the bills that we have seen are, are excessive. And if, if I were as an attorney to bill in that manner, I would find myself without clients because they would be questioning my bills. Uh, they would be questioning all of the running up of the tab uh, that goes on. I mean, we have situations where we have three people going out on, on an inspection. I think the uh, inspection in March 30th, for instance, where Mr. Mossler, uh, the pictures that you saw of the trucks going in, my understanding there were three county employees that went out on that inspection. They got there at 5.30 in the morning and didn't see anything at all until 6.45 that morning. So they were standing there for about an hour and a half, three of them, and presumably building the quarry for their time. In conclusion, first of all, I appreciate the commission taking the time. I think we're now into about uh, nearly four hours, and, and perhaps deliberations will take us well into the lunch hour and beyond. All we ask is that the commission give us a fair consideration, which I have no, uh, no doubt will happen, but we're just having a real problem communicating with staff and, and understanding their positions. Uh, your staff have been very professional to me. They've been very courteous. They've been very nice. So it's not anything like that. It's simply the positions they've taken I simply can't understand and I think are not supportable. So. We've laid out the relief that we've requested in our letters. I think all of you know what we're asking for, which is to deny uh, or to sustain our appeal as to each of the grounds raised. Thank you, Commissioners. And, and if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Any questions? Thank you, Mr. Cole. Thank you. Uh, are there any closing comments of staff? <coughs> yes. I speak because when the other side was speaking, everybody was joining in over there, and I'd like to have an opportunity for some rebuttal if I may. Go ahead. The one of the major things I'm here represented by counsel. All right, I I think that I am fairly intelligent and understand this business fairly well or whatever, but I'm doing battle with government. Now, my counsel is a mining expert. He has written a book on SMARA. To my knowledge, the only book that's been written on SMARA, how it works, the rules, regulations, and everything. He's out of Roseville, California. So I went the distance to find someone who's extremely knowledgeable in this field. Now, I have tried myself working with the county. When Pat was there, I was able to work with him. Today, I'm not able to work with the county. And I don't believe it's just because I'm the proverbial hard ass or whatever, or what part of no didn't I understand, whatever thing might be. Derek is running the show for me at this time per my request because we have to go through and do the administrative process, create the paper document to where everything is finalized properly. Now, he made good points about the fact that for whatever reason, this thing now has blown up and stopped. It's, you know, we're at an impasse. We need an impartial jury to take and look at this stuff with an open mind and say, okay, take the hard feelings out on this side, take the hard feelings out on this side, and come up with some logic here. Because all of this stuff just you look at the bills from 08, uh, the time and whatever, and you look at it today, and it's it's here today. The um, now, as far as my equipment goes, 
Every piece of equipment that I own is permitted with the state of California. There's a new law that has come up. It's called the PERP program that every piece of construction equipment has to be permitted. And it's mainly for government uh, knowing what you have so that they, you, they can force you to get rid of your older equipment and it all comes down to air pollution, basically, which is fine. But I wanted everybody to know every piece is permitted, not listening to these people and thinking, oh, well, I'm just running up a bunch of equipment up there that uh, they don't know anything about and all this business. Now, whenever I took over the mine and uh, I read my conditions and previous owner had five machines there or whatever he had and I had more. I'm doing more, it requires more equipment and whatever. So I submit to the county a letter with the list. Here, you know, I'm a miner. You know, some people think I'm a dumb miner. So I think I'm doing what is required of me to do per my conditions. I sent the letter. Here's the list. Okay, county, act on it. Guess what? I should have known. I'm making an assumption. I should have known. Oh, well, I have to submit a permit adjustment or whatever uh, in order to do this. But guess what? Nobody ever told me about this. I don't have 40 hours a week that I can sit in an office and read all the county's books and get up to speed and have this attorney and then this other attorney, hey, they are over there, they go to school to learn all of this stuff, and then they sit and read all day long, and they say, oh, we found something on Mr. Mossler right here. He didn't read this, and he didn't know this. Well, guess what? I'm guilty. I didn't know it. But I sent three letters to the county. That should have shown my intent as to what I wanted to do. I wanted to work with or follow the rules. Now, there's another mine in the county that can do whatever he wants to do. But that's a whole different subject, a whole different deal. But there's... I, I am... I ask for equal treatment under the law. And here, I'm not getting it. I'm, I'm not getting it from county planning. Because we have dear old Pacific Rock down in Camarillo that is, we could go on for two more days with everything that that guy's doing and whatever, but we don't need to go there. And I wasn't going to go there, but I want to make my side clear to you, I am trying to abide by the rules and regulations. And now, as soon as I read something and I take my interpretation, here, Jim Otusa, county geologist, I have letters from him that say, I have a severe safety issue with too much dirt in that quarry. I have to get rid of the dirt out of that quarry. Dirt is a waste product. I have, I go and we look at the SMAR rules and regulations. I have a copy of SMAR rule and like regulation, the definition of waste material according to SMAR. It differs from his definition that he got. So if he has his definition, I can bring my box of papers up. I can give you another state definition that says I am right and he's wrong. So we're going to argue back and forth, but we're not. Dirt, I am inundated with dirt up there. I have to get rid of the dirt. Jim Otusa has written, the county's geologist has told staff it's a safety issue, the dirt has to go. He's written letters saying that. My geologist says he's done, with my geologist I got a stack of reports that every six months, he's up there four times a year as a geological engineer, He's made the studies of the quarry. I work under his direction. He tells me, is it safe to do this? Is it safe to do that? You should take this down. You should leave this. That's who I work under. I don't work under the smart inspectors coming out and saying, Mr. Mosler, I don't think you should do this. I don't think you should do that. 
She doesn't have the knowledge, she doesn't have the experience, and she doesn't have the insurance or whatever like my geotech has. If he writes a report and says this is stable and it fails, he's the one that is going to be liable for this. Now, I have, I have done all of this. I continue to do this. And I, that's the only way I want to operate because of the severe safety issues. Again, Derek was a little bit incorrect he, when he said that we were mining from the top down. We're not mining from the top down because this approved reclamation plan says we have to mine from the bottom up. I want to go and mine from the top down. So what I am requesting is do away with this phased mining because it is totally impractical, unworkable, undoable. But what planning is going to force me to do, amend my CUP to be able to do away with that, and then I say, okay, here, planning, here's my CUP. I open it up to you, and then I'm going to get gutted. And I'm going to have a major problem on my hands. And then the issue of these violate or the, these complaints. Here I get this complaint here. Yes, this is an employee of mine, Sam Shirk. He's worried about losing his job. Now, here we have this. She's saying that all of these complaints. This is all confidential information. We've done document requests and gotten copies of all this. It's in the public record already. It's not document. There's over a hundred of these, and they're all coming from stop to trucks. So they're not confidential information. They want you to believe it's all confidential. We have done the document requests to get them. The shirt uh, uh, went over to Howard Smith's uh, Mr. house. M Mr. Moser, could you kind of wind it up? Because okay. we're, we're kind of going off on the computer. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll be uh, all... And, and could you just explain what you mean, you'll get gutted? What do you mean? When you said you'll get gutted, you you want to uh, I, modify your CUP, but you're worried that you'll be gutted. What right. do you mean? I got 20 truck trips now. I'll end up with 10. You know, or I'll they'll restrict my operation to where it'll, I won't be able to take and operate. I got Because you. it's that's that's where it's all going. Because look at what's happening here today. Why am I here today? Why, now, you ask the question, one of you asked the question, well, how do you abate this? Let's take the one, one violation for being, uh, coming, the truck's coming to the quarry before 7 o'clock. If you have that, you should have a copy of that violation in front of you. If you look in there, it's going to say, how do you abate it? Send a letter or to promise Promise the county I won't do this anymore. That's all I have to do. I say, hey, county, I won't do. I won't have any trucks come in before seven o'clock again. It's abated. It's done. It's over. But why are we here then? If it's that easy for me to take and do that, we're here because I have a serious problem doing my operating my business with county government. And I am looking to an impartial group to take and look at it and do something about it. So that's kind of where I'm at. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mosley. Uh, before I close the public hearing, are there any other closing comments by staff? Um, I, I'm just wondering um, if staff could follow up on, on how to abate it. And I've noticed the numerous letters that um, have talked about what has to be done in order to move forward, not to shut him down, but to uh, have compliance and uh, to move forward. Um, in regards to what Mr. Mosser said about the truck trips and certifying that he won't have the trips come to the site at 7, that is correct if um, a lot of, some of these violations he could just work within his permanent com um, conditions and they would be abated. We are here today because he filed an appeal to those violations. He doesn't want to operate within those conditions. He wants to operate within his own set of conditions. So, um, but, but, no, but we just heard that he is willing to accept the, the limitations on time. And, uh, and so th that sounds like it's off the table now. 
he's going to comply by this by the time does it does that seem is that what you heard yes. anybody else hear that well but I think that the violation is because of what he's done not what he's going to do or not going to do I mean that, I, that's my feeling uh, I see I see okay and in fact there's if you look in your um, attachment there is the letter the September 15th letter from mr. Cole that has um, some uh, alternative condition language so it's my understanding that mr. Mosler does not want to work with the conditions he has but these alternative conditions that are being proposed by mr. Cole uh, mr. chair yes. uh, members of the Commission uh, if I may speak for a moment um, I first like to say that uh, all of what uh, mr. Mosler wants to do uh, could likely be accommodated, but he has to follow the process. And the process is to uh, file for a modified conditional use permit and file for an amended reclamation plan and go through the process. And in terms of his fear that somehow his operation will be gutted if, his, if the CUP is reopened and reheard by the county decision makers, well, that's the way it is. He purchased the property with a certain CUP that had certain conditions on it, and if he wants to go outside those conditions, he has to apply for a modification and then it's a judgment by the county as to what that modification will entail um, that being said uh, mr. Cole mentioned something uh, which I, I thought was quite remarkable he said that uh, all this additional equipment on the site uh, well it's okay it's just for the mining uh, uh, it's just for the same mining that we're going to do anyway well the problem with that is that uh, in the environmental document the emissions and perhaps noise of a particular set of equipment was analyzed and now they want to use different equipment and 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 a lot more equipment, and uh, and he just announced that he had concluded his analysis that there wasn't going to be an impact. Well, we prefer to analyze first and come to a conclusion later, and that's the purpose of applying for a CUP modification. We would analyze that, and we might come to the conclusion after an analysis that yeah, you're right, there is no additional impact here, and we can grant the modification to add this additional equipment. And, but interjecting there, even if there were say on the environmental front that's an informational uh, uh, process right that just says this is what could occur and then still there's another step where decision makers decide whether or not that's acceptable or whether it could be mitigated or uh, you know work out plans that that's correct you've apparently been sitting in that chair for a while it just doesn't it doesn't stop there no, it doesn't say j just because you have an air quality impact ah, that's it no, uh, Commissioner Duke is exactly correct. I mean, that's why we have a modification process to review these issues, and it may come back to you with staff's recommendation that there's no additional impact, and then you would decide. In but your but to but to argue with that, even if there were an impact, you could still you could deal problem. with that impact. Yes. Okay. Yes, it's not a, a certainty. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out: I'm looking at the aerial photographs on the map, and I, I would submit to you that. Uh, I'm a pretty experienced uh, reviewer of aerial photographs and maps in general. Just to let you know my background, I'm a certified engineering geologist and a certified hydrogeologist and a registered geologist for the state of California. Um, and there's some substantial differences between those two photographs that occurred between 2004 and 2008, including additional uh, disturbance of ground outside the mining boundary that's shown on the 2008 photograph. So I, I don't look at those photographs and say, gosh, everything's exactly the same as it was in 2004. I, I don't see that myself, just on the, the cursory review of the photograph in front of us. Um, uh, the uh, the uh, PERP program, which I think is a rather unfortunate uh, acronym myself, uh, is, is uh, the um, uh, Portable Equipment uh, Registration Program that is run by the state. Well, registering a piece of equipment that is going to be on the site with the state is not permission to bring it on the site. You need to amend your conditional use permit. You're just following another ministerial registration required by the state. And as I said before, you have to comply with all laws, not those that you choose to comply with. And, and so that has no bearing. You don't automatically amend your CUP because you've got a, a you register a piece of equipment with the state agency. Um, and, you know, and, and I think, uh, uh, sure. <laughs> he he's, I'm told that he submitted two letters which supposedly contained a current list of equipment and 
I don't know if it did or didn't. I don't know if that's what's on site or not on site. And I, I, the CUP says that that has to be improved and approved in writing by the planning director. Could he not? Could he not presume that if he'd submitted that and received nothing back, that, that it was deemed approved? I understand you're supposed to have something in writing, but isn't there some obligation on the part of staff or county to say you've got to do something beyond this? Let me just step in there because I would say yes. There is an obligation on the county to say that. And um, I don't know what happened with the prior SMARA coordinator. She should have made that. It looks like it came to her attention. She should have brought that to her manager's attention, who should have brought it to mine, that's saying, here, planning director, here's a condition. Staff has looked at it. The manager has approved it. And now it's here for your um, review. That did not happen. So um, we would do that. You know, we would go through that process. They need to submit that permit adjustment. And what I really want to be clear here is that the, the planning staff does want to work with Mr. Mosler and Mr. Cole to get this permit into compliance. And we are very, very willing to do that. I, in looking back onto the record, sometimes before my time or before Dan's time, recognized there were mistakes to be made. And I do want to recognize those mistakes on staff's part. But I also then want to move forward with when we did recognize those mistakes and, and this, this continual debate that we're having about the county did not process or the county did not work on this reclamation plan amendment that was had. I mean, there is one set of facts here and there's the set of facts of the letters that are exchanged, the emails that are exchanged between Mr. Um, Clement and Mr. Cole about the state has come back with what you need to do to that amended reclamation plan, Mr. Cole, and here is what you need to resubmit. I don't see that resubmittal happening. Now, the county actually went to the Office of Mine Reclamation and said, hey, Office of Mine Reclamation, we don't believe that this is a substantial de deviation. We believe that we can work with Mr. Mosler to do this. And there was an exchange of letters that went back and forth. But where it sits now, where it looks like the administrative record sits, is in their court. The Office of Mine Reclamation is waiting for something. But, but the question was specifically, can he make the assumption that it was approved by the county simply by their silence? Wasn't that the question? Basically, yeah. Th this was on the, the, the equipment, equipment list. list. And, I, you know, that assumption, I think, is different than, than the facts. I mean, so the, the county never acknowledged receipt of that. They said that they needed a planning director determination or a planning okay, director approval. I can approval see letter, a whole host of problems with making assumptions that because you send something in the mail. Right. <laughs> that somebody, so, that somebody no, got I, it and... I understand what the condition says, planning director written approval. Uh, Mr. Chair, Commissioner Onstott, I'd just like to point out that um, the responsibility for operating in compliance with your conditional use permit rests with the operator. It is their responsibility to maintain compliance with their own permit. And, and I would point out that um, uh, there is no uh, self-serve process by which you can self-amend your CUP and self-amend your reclamation plan. You have to go to your lead agency to have those things done. And so, uh, you know, this discussion like, I don't work under the SMARA, and I quote, I don't work under the SMARA inspector, well, frankly, you do, because they're there to make sure that you do not mine in a manner which prevents the reclamation plan, or the site from being reclaimed in accordance with the approved reclamation plan. So you do work under your CUP, and you do work under your approved reclamation plan. Uh, one point uh, Mr. Cole made is that uh, the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act is largely a reclamation uh, law. Well, of course, the intent of the law originally, uh, and the, the impetus for it being passed, was to make sure that we didn't have uh, toxic sites which occur uh, around the state of California from past mining activities. And, but it is the Surface Mining and Reclamation Act, and it actually guides mining. And I, I would point out that in Section uh, 2712, that's Public Resources Code 2712, it is the intent of the legislature to create and maintain an effective and comprehensive surface mining and reclamation policy with regulation of surface mining operations so as to assure, and then there's a list. And then uh, the State Mining and Geology Board adopted uh, regulations uh, and, uh, that implement this law, which include surface mining practice. And there's a whole series of standards for surface mining practice. So this is the mining law of the state of California, not just the reclamation law. Uh, so uh, again, uh, 
All that's required here is to go through the required process to amend your reclamation plan. If the decision makers want to add additional conditions to the CUP, that's within their discretion, but that's the process. He purchased the property and purchased a condition use permit that had certain provisions, and that's what he has. And if he wants something else, he has to go to amend it. Thank you. Any other questions for staff? Thank you very much. Sure. At this point, I'd like to close the public hearing and begin our deliberations. Have we already um, included exhibits A through e? G and e. exhibit 10 and e. 11 into the record? And 12. I'll ask the exhibit chief that. Yeah. So I'll second that motion to accept those exhibits. <coughs> Where's 12? 12. Oh, 12 was the complaint. Was that was the complaint. And 12. Okay. okay. The additional language that we... Yeah, the, the, the minor change. So have we done that? No. I'll put, so like I said, I'll second your motion to do that. Okay. Okay. I didn't, I didn't make a motion, but... <laughs> but you did okay. it so well. <laughs> um... I'm I'm really hearing the frustration at uh, being caught in a catch-22, but I, I see a way out. Um, if uh, uh, if we do move forward with uh, with following staff recommendations uh, to uh, to deny this appeal, it does seem that. There are, there are certain things that uh, uh, are procedural. They're not substantive. Uh, and uh, that he's caught kind of like in this bureaucratic night, you know, this paper nightmare. And uh, there's a lot of distrust that I'm hearing. But um, I don't, uh, I, can, I, can, I can feel it and I can hear it. But um, I don't think that uh, this is, uh, moving forward, that this is insurmountable. Uh, so my, my feeling is, um, just, just to put it out there, that, uh, that uh, the case was not made that product trucks were intended to limit uh, the productivity of the mine and to limit tra traffic to only product. Um, I, I found that very hard to believe. Also, the, uh, the notion of uh, truck queuing and everything, all of these things we're very familiar with. Uh, if it says 7 a.m., it's 7 a.m. If it's, it's, if it's 6.50, who cares? But um, if it's, uh, you know, outside of those hours, then, then it's a problem. It, uh, the, uh, the other, notion, the other uh, problems with the appeal... I didn't find that uh, the uh, the appellant made his his case. Um, I would uh, I would follow the staff's recommend ac recommended actions, but I'd like to see that things get moved forward. And uh, if there was some way that we could, uh, you know, drop it and get him out of this catch twenty two and this impasse, if there was another path. I'd certainly be hope, open to hearing it. That is not a motion. That's just my opinion. Okay. okay. You? Steve? Steve? Well, I have to support staff. I do have a problem with this equipment situation when a man submits two letters. And maybe he knew or should have known because the permit says approved in writing by the planning director. But I have a problem that staff didn't direct him or say something to him. And so I do have a problem with that violation, but I uh, understand that he's technically in violation and I would support staff recommendation, although I have a real problem with that particular situation. And I do feel sorry for him in that he is burdened by overwhelming regulations, which must be a horrible conflict and expense to him. That's it. I, I agree with Commissioner Onslaught that 
whenever you try to do anything like this, especially with mines, you're dealing with many, many organizations, and it must extremely be frustrating. But there's a reason, I guess, for this, because it's so important for safety, for transportation, for other aspects, for pollution. So I understand that. I certainly, I support the staff recommendations. And I had a question for our council. Uh, the Planning Commission, I'm assuming, has the authority to modify a CUP, suspend a CUP, or revoke a CUP. Is that correct? That's what it says. In, that's what it said after, in our in our agenda. Well, there none of those actions are before you right now. Uh, yes, I know that. Oh, yeah. I, I, you know, I'm not saying. Oh. <laughs> because we, there's no way that we can act on on the modification, suspension, or revocation of the, of the permit? Not now, no. How would that have to come about? Another? Uh, yeah, well, there's many ways it could come about, but uh, it would have to be, in generally, it'd have to be agendized. You'd have to have, a, you know, there's different ways of, that they can be presented to you. You know, third okay. parties can yeah, I, apply to have revocation. The planning director probably answer this more specifically. Let me just read directly out of the section that requires it. Modification, suspension, and revocation for cause is what it's called, section 811-6.2. And to your question, Commissioner Molotar, any permit or variance here to for or hereafter granted may be modified or revoked or its use suspended by the same decision-making authority and procedure which would normally approve the permit or variance under this chapter. But it would have to be agendized before we could do it. So. Right, and, and there has to be an application. It says an application for such modification, suspension, or revocation may be filed by any person or entity um, listed in Section 81121 or by any other aggrieved person. Okay, thank you. Okay, which, which is to say that Mr. Mosler could file a modification to a CUP and no? Well, that's not the section that requires for him to file. That's if, if somebody else wants to file a modification. He can file a modification um, to his permit under a minor modification or a major modification, and we've given him that option over the years. There, there's a process for him if, if he's if the and some of these are on. even even more minor than a minor mod. More minor, we would be happy to sit down and really walk through the conditions, which ones could be handled by the planning director, which ones need to be uh, handled by a modification, and, and how he feels that he needs to operate under his permit. We can absolutely sit down and do that. Good. Thank you. All right. Commissioner Wessner. I'm probably the only person in this room who was here in 1995. <clears throat> no old person jokes, all right. Um, at that time, we were starting to deal with a lot of the mining issues in this county that we have been living with since about 1948. We heard this was about on board about 1939. There was a lot of issues about the county sheriff's honor farm, the need for supply of materials. We had a number of citizens from the Ojai Valley here obviously opposing that. So therefore, uh, I was president at that time. The operator at that time, again, asking for a discretionary conditional use permit felt that this operation could support X amount of activity, which the county at that time based the issue on the fact that that would support uh, not only the Ojai up up Valley, the Honor Farm, et cetera, but also the West uh, County, which would then obviously reduce the amount of truck trips from the East County, which were most of the predominant mines are, so which would be beneficial all around. It was never anticipated to go beyond a certain size scope or activity simply because of the nature. Uh, again, getting back to the fact that this is a discretionary uh, use of a person's prop property, uh, you have to request from the governor the right to do it. So therefore, the plans were drawn up, the conditions were uh, came up, and as we uh, one of the driving bases was in Ventura City, we had a mining operation that had gotten abandoned, and unfortunately, it belonged to the county on the Samara Act, but we were having boulders rolling into elementary school. So. If the mining operator does not operate within the conditions that we are, the county winds up being responsible. So again, getting back to the fact this is a discretionary use permit, uh, I certainly do appreciate Mr. Mossler's situation that over the last 15 years, the level of government involved uh, has gotten more and more complicated, but we've seen that on multiple issues, not including cellular towers. 
So as the local agency, our responsibility is exactly that. If we're going to allow the land user to have a discretionary permit to do X, then we have the ability to put Y conditions. If that individual agrees with that, then they're allowed to operate. The fact that now we have violations that were brought before the planning director, we are now here, the appeal of those violations in according to that discretionary permit. I am a little disturbed by the fact of the chart that Mr. Cole put up there, the rise in the last year, the amount of time which Exhibit F of Stop the Truck seems to have triggered it, over 100 complaints. Again, we are complaint driven. Is that a matter before us? Is this a proper venue? The answer is no. What is before us? Are there violations? Was there sufficient basis for the violations? And that's what we're here to deliberate. So with that, Mr. Chair, is my position on it. I would entertain a motion. I move the staff recommendation. Do you, would you like me to read them? Or just remove staff recommendation? That's fine. Do I have a second? Second, if that includes the modified Exhibit 12 language that staff presented to us. I thought that was incorporated. Okay. I just want to make it clear. Did you second that? Yes, sir, I did. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? I just, I hear a lot of distrust, a lot of impediments to moving forward and being able to be in compliance, provide the services that, you know, operate as business. There's a lot of I's to dot and T's to cross. And I'm really hopeful that this doesn't translate, the denial of your appeal doesn't translate to you as, you know, they want to shut me down. It's certainly not my desire at all. Any other discussion? Well, I would also say that this quarry operation is valuable to the County of Ventura, and I would like to see it continue to operate and you be able to operate it in a profitable fashion. Anything else? All in favor of the motion and the second? Signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carried 4-0. Thank you very much. We'll go on to the next agenda item. Yes. We'll give two minutes for. If we can, with the agenda items on a discussion report by the planning director on board actions and other matters. Do you have anything? Thank you very much. I just wanted to go over the agenda and maybe get your availability for some important hearings that are going to be coming up. The housing element update is going to be here, and we're looking at February 3rd or the 10th. So I want to kind of track those days in February. And then also I expect the Simi Valley Landfill project to probably be before you sometime in February. No. Moving forward. And then also, more than likely, the Grimes Canyon mining sites will be here in February. So, you know, February, March is going to be a very busy, busy month with big projects. So we're really going to try to get your schedules and see if we can get some commitments on those dates. Okay. On that point, Danielle can just remind us, and then we can check our calendars and get back by e-mail. 
uh, Madam Director, if you would real quick on the housing element. Um, refresh my memory. Will we discuss the county's obligation as far as uh, the low income housing? The reason I asked this specifically is that most of the Section 8, except other programs like it, tend to exist within the 10 cities, and I'm not aware of anything specifically within the county. What do you mean low income housing? Just that, that element of the whole element within the housing element that we have to satisfy. Is that something that we can borrow from the other jurisdictions? Uh, mm -hmm. Is that pretty? All right, if you can just make a mental note to make sure we address that during, during the review. Okay. Do, do, am sure. I clear as mud or? No, uh, no, I understand what you mean. Okay. We'll make sure, yeah, we come back with that. Anything else, Kim? I don't have anything else. Do you have anything for me? I would like to maybe maybe at the next meeting because I think the next meeting might be short, just on those towers, right? That's the only agenda item on the next meeting. That is on December 9th. Yes. I only have one thing on the agenda. Uh -huh. And that's those towers. Yes. Okay. I'd like to at that point, if I could, make a, a report on the, on the state the state meeting that I attended okay. for planning commissioners, and I have some information for you and so forth. All right, anything we'll else? Sure to get that on the, we'll get that on the agenda. Okay. Okay. Anything else? Thank you, commissioners. Thank you, everyone, for your help. Meeting's adjourned.